It began as a ripple, an online whisper, a grassroots awakening to a new threat on freedom. I've had a, a yearning inside of me for quite some time. In order to go on living within myself, I had to take an action. This is not the beginning. It's a continuation. The president serves us. The Congress, they serve us. Lady Liberty faces her newest challenge, and across this great nation, a new generation of patriots stands ready for her defense. When you have government control over everything, you have tyrannic behavior. We want fiscal responsibility. We'll give them some stimulus. Do you think Congress can hear us now? They were ignored. They were mocked. But in the end, they would not be silenced. If you don't get involved in the process, your voice is never heard. A greater cause united them. I don't care what party you're in. A greater outcome awaits them. We're here to be great, We're not mediocre. The story of 2009 becomes the living history of the second American Revolution. Tea Party, the documentary film. Liberty's March as a new generation of patriots. If we were to allow the free market to take its course now, it would almost certainly lead to disorderly bankruptcy and liquidation for the automakers. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Wherever the market is allowed to run rampant through excessive risk-taking, a lack of regulation, or corruption, then all are in danger. We have to act. We have to act now. Because if we don't move swiftly to put this plan in motion, our economic crisis could become a national catastrophe. We risk sinking into another crisis down the road. You've got to get it done this year. Uh, the stars are aligned. And if we don't have it signed into law by then, we will not have it. Starting today, we must pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and begin again the work of remaking America. Remaking America. Remaking America. Wait a minute now. I don't know if this country will be the same when my kids grow up. They're not listening to the people. Things have gotten to a point where I've got to do something. I've got to do something. It's time to call for American values, people. The hard work, folks, starts with us. We have to have the spine. They're going to hear us. This is just the start. I've never seen anything like it. The public is really very, very resistant. We thought we would have five or six tea parties. We had 48 that Friday. Less than eight weeks, we have over 800 tea parties across the country. This is what we're talking about. This initiative is funded by the high end. We call it AstroTurf. It's not really a grassroots movement. They don't like the idea that this is a bottom-up grassroots rebellion against the government. This plan will require significant resources from the federal government. The government can't run a free lunch properly. Tea Party people know more about the bills that are being passed than the Congress people do. What good is reading the bill if it's a thousand pages? They've been trying to pass these bills. They finally got their opportunity. Our society depends on grassroots involvement to defend liberty. Let's take more freedom! We're making a difference. And I'm going to let them know that I'm angry and I'm going to stand up for my right. We just have to vote people out. You have an obligation to speak up. Take an action now or complain later.
We're going to D.C. to let Congress and the White House know we want fiscal responsibility. We want constitutionally limited government. Up the revolution! This is not the beginning. It's a continuation. The March of Washington ends nothing. Why, why am I going? Because I have to. It's my job as a patriot. Anybody on board? Without a tax, bailouts. Can't... We're bringing doctors from all over the country to go to Washington, tell our elected officials, listen guys, you got it wrong. Government is not the right way to do it. So I'm going to a party. Baby, won't you come along? Why am I going to D.C.? I'm going to get on a bullhorn, I'm going to yell, and I'm going to scream. Before all of my freedom's gone. People will be coming from all over the country on their own hooks. People who love freedom like to congregate together in support of freedom. This is a movement of we the people. This is a movement where the silent majority has finally stood up and said, we've had enough. Tell me what kind of party. 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 We're going to stand and fight. Being able to go up to D.C. It's definitely a privilege. This is a new revolution, a peaceful solution, to make sure all the leaders not to heed the Constitution. So raise up your voices while you still can, and show them that you're proud to be American. And let's go to a party, baby, won't you come along? We're gonna do what's right, before all of our freedom, stand and fight, before all of our freedom... Things are moving. Before all of our freedom's gone. <laughs> Good job, Anthony. Good job. Good stop, Christian. That a boy, good throw. I have more fun than my son, I'm sure. 47-year-old trying to pretend I'm 18 again. I had no idea it would be this fun, coaching, watching, you know, getting excited. I'm guilty of being an armchair politician, sitting on the sidelines saying that's wrong, that's wrong, barking and complaining about this, that, and the other thing, and that's all I do. And I've come to realize in the last few years that I'm either part of the problem or part of the solution. Sitting on the couch complaining and not doing anything is just adding to the problem and not doing anything. I can't live with myself and do that anymore, and that's why I got involved in the Tea Party. Step back, guys. I've always dreamed about going to D.C. I get to exercise my First Amendment rights you know, with a whole bunch of other people who are finally getting off the couch and, and, and taking a stand. But whether it's you know, our current president or some of the things that Bush did in his office, I don't care. It's not a partisan thing. It's taking control away from them and putting it in our hands and saying, this is what you do for us. A large part of our country, Democrat, Republican, and Independent, have thought that we could just let representatives go to Congress and just legislate and serve us. And what we're finding is no matter what side of the, of the uh, aisle you're on in Congress, those people have to be reined in. I grew up in a military family. I was a Vietnam veteran. We were always very patriotic, always very committed to history. And I've been doing reenacting for a long time. My degree is in fine art. I've been a, a painter, I do oil and watercolor paintings, and I do paintings of historical subjects. Each painting takes about a year to do, and uh, the research is nine months of it, usually. I usually have four or five books per painting. And uh, you can't really paint a historic painting until you know everything. The weather, because uh, if you do assume something, by the time you do it, there's likely, uh, if you paint a cloudy day and it was a clear sky, everyone that knows anything about it is going to tell you. I like to paint things that other people haven't painted. I could probably do another copy of, uh, of Pickett's Charge, but there are probably 20 versions of that out there now. Uh, this one's the second Seminole Indian War, and there's hardly any artwork about it. I started out with Secret Service up in Washington, D.C. as a graphic designer and uh, worked for them for eight years downtown D.C. So I got to see a lot of, the, of what goes on in, in Washington, D.C. with the staffs and with the permanent political class that's there. But of course, being in the, in the government, I couldn't speak out. Those who will not obey the constitutional limits of government have got to go, and their staffs have got to go with them. Next 
Dr. Fred Chesso. Dr. Herman, thank you. I want to tell you all how proud I am to be out here among you. I'm a regular practicing doctor, and the reason I'm here is because I see that the government's health care plan is going to rob you of your ability to make your own decisions about your own health care. It makes the entire American public angry. Look around out there. You see, I mean, the town halls will tell you there's a bunch of angry people. And, and I think we're not only angry, but we're really scared. We're concerned. You know, this is, we're going to end up with something that nobody wants, that the American public does not want. We don't want it. The patients don't want it. Ultimately, the economy's not going to want it. And they're just shoving this down our throat. Doesn't that bother you? If um, having a kidney stone. So probably what we're going to do with you is send you for some x-rays. But let's take a quick look at you and just see. Hurts a little bit on that side, huh? Yeah. yeah that would kind of go along with kidney stones. I spent, what, uh, eight years of postgraduate training and I spent 29 years of my life being a doctor. And, and the reason that I do that is so that I can take care of patients. Most doctors that I know do this because we not only wanted to make a living, but we wanted to make a difference. We really wanted to help people and take care of people. And, and, and that's been my goal. And, and now I see a government that's coming in saying, you know, I'm not gonna let you do that anymore. I'm not gonna let you take care of people the way you think you should. I'm gonna set up some panel up here that's gonna tell you what you can do and what you can't do and you can't advocate for your patient anymore. You have to follow these rules or guess what? You get fined or thrown in jail. So, yeah, that makes me angry. I voted for Barack Obama and I don't think that was a really great decision on my behalf, but I wanted change so bad and, you know, I was tired of Bush and the whole Bush politics and his whole administration that I was just ready to move on to something new. Somebody walked up to you and just took the money out your pocket <laughs> and you knew that they took the money out your pocket, right? right? You felt the money come out your pocket and you, you look back and you say, this cat just took, are you gonna sit there and let them run away with your money? Or are you gonna turn around and you're gonna do something about it? Yeah, you're gonna catch them, right? You're gonna reach your arm out, you're gonna long arm them exactly. and say, come on back here, right, with my money, right? Exactly. Well, that's exactly what's going on. They've taken your money right out your pocket. And I'm more in the uh, small, limited government type thing. Not the government, you know, take from, from us, from the working class, and then hand it out to everybody. To actually go up to someone and talk to them about this and they have no idea about it, it, it is kind of a frightening thing because you never know how a person is going to react. However, I feel like not only is it my patriotic duty, but it's my duty as a, as a fellow human being to tell my fellow man Hey, listen, do you know this is going on? Because at least if they know, they have an option to do something about it. Without knowing, they don't have any options at all. You need to know about that stuff. You know, why, whose agenda is this? How does it benefit me and how does it, it benefit everybody? I mean, don't listen to what they say. Listen to what they sign. Our Tea Party organizer, Jenny Beth Martin. to be fiscally responsible with our tax dollars. They're our tax dollars. I've been involved in the Tea Party movement since the very beginning. The Tea Party Patriots formed as the, the organization to keep the people who are interested in just the Tea Party type issues, which are fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. We formed to keep those people engaged. Did you have a good day at school? Yeah, here we You had a hearing and a seeing test. Did you pass yeah. those? I can yes. So I want you to be able to hear and see. Don't you? Yes. What about here? What? <laughs> Do you want to be able to hear? Which yellow? 42? Yes. Four I used all of my artistic talent in that one plate, and I'll never be able to do anything yeah, else again. My daughter will make a list. Like, she'll say, which do you want me to draw? A cat, a rainbow, or a dog? And she'll draw a little picture of each of them. And she'll go around to all of us in the family and say, vote, which one do you want? The cat, the rainbow, or the dog? And so if there are three votes for the rainbow, then that's the one that she draws. And so I've already, they already understand the importance of elections. <laughs> 
hope that when my children grow up and they look back on this time in their life and in our country's history and the, the things that I've done, it is my hope that they see that I was working for something that was important for their future and for their generation's future, but that I didn't do it at the expense of um, ignoring the present and ignoring my time with them. We are citizens who are active on the internet, whose minds and hearts are fixed on the noble purpose of restoring the limited Republican form of government the founders created in 1789. We're here to tell Congress to repeal the pork-filled stimulus package or expect us to retire you in 2010. The Tea Party movement was the response to a crescendo of bad things going on at the federal level. I really believe it began in March of 2008 when Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns came to the fore. And then you move on into the summer uh, of 2008. The banks were beginning to have problems and Washington was saying, oh, don't worry, we'll help you. Uh, and the American people said, what do you mean the government's going to help them? Washington is considering a, a solution that doesn't resemble anything we recognize. Uh, and so I, I was scratching my head. I know American people across this land were scratching their head and saying, what on earth are you doing? In October 2008, George W. Bush signed into law the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP as it came to be known. It enabled the government to take a place at the table of what were formerly private financial institutions. What the government needs to do is say hard and fast, you need to run your business the way that you ought to run their, your business and be responsible. If in fact there were bad actors in the private market, they needed to fail, they needed to be held accountable. Instead, the government stepped in and bailed them out. When TARP passed, conservatives were just fed up. They were sick of it. Then came the inauguration, and shortly thereafter, you had the stimulus bill, $787 billion. The advocates of big government typically use um, crises, whether it be times of war or particularly times of economic crisis, to use that as a wedge to drive new government programs. We saw bailing out the housing market and the automotive industry. We've got a federal government now that is running car companies. Where in the Constitution is that? When Rick Santelli gave his, his rant back in, in February, and he was saying that people needed to be responsible for themselves, so the government and neighbors didn't need to bail people out who couldn't afford their mortgages anymore, it struck a chord with me personally. You know, the, the government is promoting bad behavior. This is America. How many of you people want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage that has an extra bathroom and can't pay their bills? Raise their hand. How about we all? President Obama, are you listening? How about we all stop paying our mortgage? It's a moral hazard. We're thinking of having a Chicago Tea Party in July. All you capitalists that want to show up to Lake Michigan, I'm going to start organizing. If you read our founding fathers, people like Benjamin Franklin and Jefferson, what we're doing in this country now is making them roll over in their graves. I tweeted about it, and on Friday, February 20th, I believe, we had our first nationwide conference call. There were about 22 people on that call, and we decided we wanted to do an event, a tea party. The Boston Tea Party, here in the British Americas, a group of colonists stood up against a ship loaded down with British tea that had come into port in Boston Harbor. That tea was being taxed heavily against the colonies by the British government. The people in the colonies did not have representatives in Parliament, in Britain, and so there was no representation for the taxes that were being levied on them. It was taxation without representation. And so on December 16, 1773, they stood up against the then Governor Thomas Hutchinson in Boston and dumped the tea into the harbor. Flash forward. And that story, that principle, that spirit of we the people rising up against the tendency of government to encroach upon our lives, we're seeing it again in the 21st century. Thanks for coming today. Let's dump some tea in the water. Dump the tea. Dump the tea. The power is still in our hands. It's not your money. Disgust. 
with the stimulus package. Repeal or retire? We need to speak out. We need to start taking some action. God bless America. It's the American dream! What you're doing is important. You're exercising your right as an American. Enough is enough! If you find a socialist, kick him out of office. As it turned out, we had nearly 50 tea parties. We had over 30,000 people attend. All of this in less than five business days. We're in the right, we will wreck! The Tea Party movement from the word go was a threat to the Obama administration, to the, de the Democratic Party's attempt to say that the Republican Party is dead, the conservative movement uh, is over, and that this is going to be a permanent majority for liberal Democrats in order to expand the state. The American people stood up. It caught Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, Barack Obama, David Axelrod, uh, Anderson Cooper, uh, Janine Garofalo and Bill Maher by surprise. And these people started to call these people teabaggers. They tried to call them racist. They threw those out there because what they were trying to do was to tell the American people, the viewing public, you have to accept this. They wanted to tell these people, don't join them in their rebellion against the expansion of government. USA! USA! These folks are real. They're afraid for their future. They're angry about the disrespect for themselves in the past and the history and traditions of this great nation. These were individuals, many of whom who had never even been in a rally before. And they were coming out because they believed in some principles that were being talked about, and they believed they were being ignored. We immediately started beginning plans for the Tax Day Tea Parties on April 15th. We had a website set up, taxdayteaparty.com, and people registered their events there. There were over 850 events that we had all across the country. All of a sudden, we've got Americans that say, hey, wait a minute, we are the forgotten man here. We're the people who've been paying the bills. We're the people whose productivity, whose ability to take care of our children, whose ability to be free on our own terms is diminished. Cap and trade was the next big issue that came up. It, it passed the House in, in June, and overnight people were so angry across this country that the cap and trade passed that we planned protests in less than 12 hours across this country and had thousands of people come out and protests the cap and trade. Healthcare legislation was another thing that was supposed to be passed before the August recess. Where August recess normally comes and goes and you might get 20 or 30 folks there, there were August recess town hall meetings with congressional representatives where you had thousands of folks coming out. We have got to go to every town hall meeting. We have got to go to every elected representative and remind them that they're on our dime. Stop spending our money! People are arriving two hours early just to get in to a town hall meeting. And if they can't get in, they're standing outside. People standing in line like they were coming to the Friday night football game. And they're coming to a congressional town hall meeting holding copies of a 1,200-page health care bill that they understood better than the congressional representative who was trying to sell them this bill of goods. Are they going to be willing to be on the same plan they're asking us to be on? It'll be a cold day in hell before you socialize in my country. Yeah! I'm not so much looking for an explanation from her because I'm looking for an apology because this should not even be 
originally they had us in a room for about 150 people, but there's a little over a thousand people, so they had to move us downstairs to a large cafeteria. Once we got down there, the staffer opened up the floor for questions. She had a microphone set up. I just happened to, my parents got there before I did. They saved me a seat. I just happened to be three feet in front of the microphone. In order for states to be allowed to protect their sovereignty, we needed to send them to Washington, D.C. to be a check on the federal government. I wasn't always a grassroots activist. I don't even know if that's really the, the best term for me. It's kind of a new term for me. I'm just an American. And I've been given platforms to talk out about the Constitution because of some things that I said at a town hall meeting. So if I get the opportunity to talk about the Constitution and maybe help rally and recall some people to the Constitution, like Thomas Jefferson said, then yeah, I'll, I'll take every opportunity that I get. Benjamin Franklin was one that said that eternal vigilance is a must for this form of government, this constitutional republic. If you don't have that, you slowly lose your freedoms and liberty. The men who wrote the Constitution understood that a country built on freedom depended on a set of rules that didn't change. And the rules were all about um, the rights of the individual and limits on the government. The man that can govern the best is the man that can govern himself. So if we leave it all outside the hands of the federal government, I'm gonna have a lot more persuasion at the state and local level than I will at the federal level. The states created the federal government. The federal government did not create the states. The Tenth Amendment says that the powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states. But what we see now is a very homogenous nation, a, a, a nation that doesn't thrive on that diversity of perspective by the states. The Constitution was originally four pages long. If our founders had wanted a larger government, they would have written a longer constitution. The model they created was the first constitution in world history where the first word said that it was going to be completely different. We, the people, do ordain and establish this constitution. It's a notion and an understanding that the American people uh, are, are supreme in our system, that, that we as Americans cede power to the government. And guess what? If we the people do ordain and establish it, it's up to us to keep it. Once a man was dressed to this point with a waistcoat on, he was now decent. So all of those Errol Flynn movies where they're just fighting in their shirt sleeves was uh, totally unacceptable at that time. You've heard the term big wig. And then, of course, the inevitable canteen in which we keep our water. And we're off, off to the 1720s. Keys to the horse. This is nothing. Just get it past my canteen and we should be quite ready. Somewhere over there. And that was the... Is that a dog sniffing at the back of my head? Here we go. <laughs> I just love these things, all these rules. If I can get that in two hours later, here we are. It's going in. Yes, I think we are. I haven't put on any weight, I know that. It's not a carriage, you know. It's not easy to carriage. Do I have it? I don't want the police to arrest me. Conspirator. For want of a nail. You're in. I'm in. Off we go. As has been said many times, the government that governs best governs least. So we're best off when government goes home on vacation because then they cannot play with the American people. So we will be providing an escort for them to Charles. Yeah. Part of the reason I, I love doing uh, reenacting is because it teaches you what really happened. The role of these places in history are so important, and yet our educational system is ignoring the history of this country. Now, we're actually going to fire a volley. So who gets the bailout money, the English or the Spanish? <laughs> we'll give them some stimulus. Fire! <laughs> to the walls, men! Double quick! Quickly! On the walls! The Spanish, huh? Spanish, yes. So on either side to behind them. Quickly! Double quick! Behind them!
going to be a problem, gentlemen. William's a warm man. Uh, he's marvelously talented, uh, very insightful. Uh, he's full of, William's definitely full of the flavor of life. We'd heard that there were some protesters coming, so then the papers showed up. And I thought, look at that. They won't even come to our rally until they hear that there's a protester. I said, well, Don, you did fine. We need a protester at every rally because that'll bring the press out. So this guy shows up and he comes screaming across the street at us, yelling and all this stuff. And uh, yeah, this guy right here. And uh, he actually got in front of this one old, older lady and started yelling and screaming at her. And he said, well, I'm a black man and I've been black all my life. And I, all I could think was, that is a, you know, what kind of comment is that? And I said, well, I'm a, I, I'm a white guy. And he said, well, I'm a pastor of a church. And I said, well, I'm a white pastor of a black church. And, uh, and he said, you are? What church do you go to? <laughs> and so I said, well, I go to Maranatha Church. And if you quit yelling, we'd love to have you come visit with us. And then they snap this picture, and it says that we're both yelling at each other. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're into First Timothy, and uh, let's uh, turn to the, the Word of God and settle down around the, the Lord, and uh, uh, let's, just, uh, let's just open with some prayer. Lord Jesus, we just thank The Bible you. says that perfect love casts out fear. Politics is driven by fear, and um, that's why you see a lot of very unhappy people involved with politics and, uh, and uh, power and, the, and the, the thirst for power. But my, my political beliefs uh, apply only as long as uh, they line up with the teachings of Jesus Christ, who taught that we are to love everyone um, with, a, with a, uh, uh, a sacrificial love. And if somebody approaches uh, you with love, I know that uh, you have nothing to fear. Brother Dave does a very good job at uh, bringing the word. He is very thorough and it's more than just preaching, it's a lot of teaching. Well, I have lived in communities that were mixed. I've lived in the Northeast and the Midwest and the community that I live in had been mixed earlier. I think the, the blend works real well. It helps us all to grow and it really enriches us. I've been there 20 years and the folks there just welcome me and been there ever since. I believe that if, if Christians uh, all over, regardless of denomination, regardless of, uh, of what their demographic, if they will live according to biblical principles, ultimately they will come together as one people. The Tea Party Patriots are absolutely not racist uh, or I wouldn't be a part of them. Uh, I couldn't associate myself with people who are racist. And as I said before, those who make that charge, that is, uh, that is the ultimate in degradation uh, and shows that they do not really have an argument uh, when they accuse people of, of uh, racism. Music is the musical expression of the love that I feel inside myself. It's how I take the way that I feel and turn it into sound. That's what music does for me. Some things are just timeless. Like music, no matter what happens with time, some things just aren't supposed to change or don't need to change. I think that the best way for us to fix the problem is to go back to our grassroots, to go back to what really made this country great was the U.S. Constitution. That's what made this country great. Anything short of the U.S. Constitution will not work. You have corruption in the U.S. You know, the U.S. government borrows more money from the Federal Reserve Bank. They drive us into more and more potential debt, debt that we can never pay back. So really what you're saying is that our government's become a beast. A beast. A beast. A beast. When I voted for Obama, you got to understand how that played with the psyche, the psyche of a black man or a black woman to actually be able to see, you know, the highest, uh, 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 the highest seat that you can have in the world, the, the president of the United States, you know, the highest level of power, and um, it's, it's, it's a black man. A lot of black people, they feel like they don't have a real way to make it, so, 
if they can't make it, then they might as well let the government take care of them or, you know, something to that effect. Or, or maybe they feel like, like with the affirmative action, they, maybe they feel like their voices aren't going to be heard, so they need, you know, a program set in place to kind of give them some type of assurance. What I really want to do is try to educate, especially black people. You know, black people, we never really had a political voice. Regardless to, you know, the political people like, you know, Jesse Jackson and, you know, that they get in the office or whatever and they, and they, and they voice their political opinion. It, it, really don't, it really don't capture all of us. What I want to do is educate people. I, I just want you to know what's going on so then you can have an option to do something about it or not. Don't you want to know if somebody on Capitol Hill is doing something that may ruin your way of life or jeopardize your way of life? Wouldn't you want to know about that? Yeah, definitely would. Sometimes I want to quit. I was thinking like, why am I even doing this? I have no support whatsoever from anybody that I know on my end. Everyone that I know that actually supports me are from the outside in and I don't really talk to them that much. So I'm like, why am I even involved? Am, am I involved? I mean, and then it's like a lonely battle being the only person, the black, I mean, and then I have a strong presence too. So when I'm there, you see me. So if I stand in a crowd of people of just white people, you're gonna see me, you're gonna know that it's me. And it, it, I feel a little singled out, you know? <laughs> and uh, that's, that right there is heavy. That's just really heavy. I have this voice inside my head, I don't know what it is, that just keeps telling me, right now you're all alone, but you just keep down this path and you're, gonna, you're not gonna be alone. I, I can't not change my views, even if I want to. You know, even if I doubt myself or I just, I just continue forward. That's kind of cute. Is that for a girl? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I kind of it's a boy, though. How, how did you know? I said I, kinda, I said I kind of hope. Oh, you hope. I want you. I, I hope it to be a girl. But I want my girl to do lady things, like little girly stuff. <laughs> like that. Too. No, not that. Not wearing out in public. Yeah. I want to make sure that my child is going to be born into a world to where they can actually have a future, <laughs> you know, and, and it can experience life and the American dream and, you know, not get their, their little ideals snuffed out by, you know, the big fish. Yay, our first baby stuff. I'm glad we was able to buy it together versus uh, they gonna get, your family gonna get a hold of you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Push you. Well, it's been over two years now. Lee had to close his business, and I was pregnant and had a miscarriage, and all of that happened within about a six-week period. That was by far the lowest moment of our entire marriage. Divorce never really, that was never an option. No. We, we had a few arguments, but we'd been married at that point for so long that, I don't know, we just didn't have a lot. Very good. Good job, yay. We decided to start a housekeeping. Yeah, business. I sat down and said, what if we just do some flyers and see if we can get, get housekeeping, a few housekeeping jobs that would at least give us some income. We started doing this in October, and around in October, that's when the first tarp passed, and all these companies were getting bailouts. And that was really frustrating to us personally. It went against what we believed in politically, what we think is right politically, but also it's, it's even more fundamental than that. The system is set up so that when a company fails, it fails, you file bankruptcy, and you move on. I would say several times, I'd just say, thank goodness we weren't dependent on the government, and I'd rather be sitting here cleaning this bathtub than be dependent on the government that way. And I said that several times as we were going through it. Um, and I, I felt like at least we could take pride in the work that we were doing, and, and that we were, we accepted responsibility for the mistakes that happened and the problems that happened in the business, and we moved on from it. We thought we were going to keep the house, and there were some problems with the papers that were filed, and we lost the house. I had planned to call and have all this stuff donated to, to charity and have it picked up so the neighbors wouldn't have to deal with having a huge mess out on the front lawn. 
This is the main road through this neighborhood, which has several thousand homes in it. And there's a lot of traffic that goes right by here every day. So it was a big spectacle with all this stuff out on the lawn, everybody driving by seeing it, our neighbors having to deal with it. And that's what made me feel bad. I don't want to look at the kitchen. I miss the kitchen a lot. They've ripped all the carpet off the stairs. This house is much larger than what we need. We're able to live without it, and it's just a house. It's truly just a house. The home is where the heart is, and, and it's true. We, we know what's important. Our family, our friends, our faith, our country, those are the things that are important, and those are the things that cannot be replaced. Laura. Oh, I like it. Laura Bush. Yes, ma'am. Laura Bush. And did you know that the bird is the most popular item on this menu? Wow. That doesn't surprise <laughs> me at all. <laughs> I continue to say that she is the person, the right person to do this job and because of her skills and her ability to get the job done. And no matter how many people are out there, she feels comfortable in front of the crowds knowing what is in her heart and knowing that she's doing the right thing that is right and just for the people of this country. Good to see you. How are you? Well, she's very passionate about what she does, uh, but that passion is not a passion on trying to necessarily achieve anything. It's a passion built on deep-rooted beliefs, and, and that is what people are yearning for. I mean, we have so many people that lead efforts that at the end of the day, you, you become somewhat dismayed because you're like, well, they're just doing that because that's their job. Their only desire here is to take those foundational beliefs and make sure that they remain in our country because they realize that if we are going to leave our nation to our children and grandchildren better than what we founded. <laughs> First platter on the list of platters is the Rogers, so if you come here, make sure to eat that. And adding the Reagan sauce to it because that seemed to be a perfect combination. You can see this white kidney stone here, and this is a follow-up x-ray a couple of weeks later, and the kidney stone is still there. The women that have had kidney stones and uh, babies will tell you that kidney stones are worse. Hey, Jerry. Hey. How are you? How are you? Good. Good. How you been? Good. Good. Things going well? Yes. Super. The segment's being misled because they're thinking, oh, I'm going to get all this free health care. That's what they're thinking. There is no free health care and it's not going to be good, and you're not going to get a whole bunch of it. Because once the government gets in charge, it's going to be rations. I mean, if you go look at single-payer government health care plans around the world, you can see, first of all, routine things. I mean, it, it takes you two years to get a hernia fixed. It takes you three or four years to get your knee replaced. But on a more immediate basis, you can take a place like England, where women die from breast cancer four and a half times faster than they do in this country. Why? Because they can't get mammograms as quickly, they can't get biopsies as quickly, they can't get chemotherapy that they get here. So you're going to see not only an inconvenience, but I also think you're going to see people die. Tell me, what do you think about health care reform? What do you think about the government plan? Well, I didn't understand what the, um, why it was so necessary to have this handled right now, right away. You know, we're in such dire straits. I've never felt so helpless that these people aren't listening. We have such a wonderful health care system that uh, it's, in, it's scary. It's in jeopardy, and I'm glad that you care. I'm very glad that you care. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing I think we can do is be up there and be in their face and tell them what our opinions are and tell them, you know, we're watching you. We're, not, we're going to try and not let this happen. Hold them accountable. Oh, just to hide. It so okay. Bad. Well, you look great. Thanks. We do it because we have to, because somebody has to, and you can't sit by and let these things happen. Somebody has to step up, you know. If not me, who? Three people in the next 30 days. That's my pledge and my commitment to you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody on board? Yeah. yeah. Come on. I made a pledge in front of these people that I'm accountable to today and tomorrow that I'll recruit three people in this movement. And if I have to sacrifice the time with my children, my wife, and my way of living to do that, then that's what I will do. But that is my pledge. And I did that 
because I should, and, and to invoke uh, uh, passion and commitment from other people. Don't forget about the youth. That's right. Tell your kids, your grandkids, because the time to act is now. That's correct. Don't forget. That's right. I have to be out here, as do all of us, you know, because my voice needs to be heard, and I will be heard. David is one of my recruits, one of the people that I was uh, successful in bringing on board, who's um, got a lot of passion. No, I haven't been politically active, uh, and I wouldn't even say about a year ago, because all I did was sit around and complain about what was going on, and I sat in the problem, and I didn't work on the solution. The solution is going out to the tea parties. There you go, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I came um, from work one day and uh, uh, we had gotten a letter from our homeowners association saying, you know, your house is faded, you need to paint it. Um, uh, we don't have the money for it. And I walked up uh, and all the moms were sitting there and they were just like, we're going to come paint your house. And I was like, what? I was completely blown away. I mean, so I can't tell you it's common. Um, I could just tell you how amazing these people are to me. I like doing it. It makes me feel good. You do something together and it's fun. It's community spirit, you know? I guess I happen to be a Democrat, but I don't agree with everything Democrats do. I don't agree with everything Republicans do. I respect his, his beliefs and his opinions on things, and he feels this is important to him. I think I've heard him say, when you believe in something, you know, actions speak for it, and he believes in this strongly, and I, I respect the fact that he's taken the time out of his life to go up to Washington and do what he's got to do. That's a log cabin that your, your uh, Uncle Art built. That's a true he log built. cabin. That's his land, his trees off his land. They cut it and they went up there and they built it. Who's that dude right there? <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Please get our troops home safe and soon. Amen. 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 Okay, so you guys had a good day off school today. Yep. Got to do good things. We play the bees. I think the second place team. I thought we already beat them once. Yeah, we lost by two runs. You guys are studying Paul Revere, and you're studying the Boston Tea Party, all at this time when your dad is doing what he's doing. I think that's really neat. So do you guys know what daddy's doing? Mm-mm. What do you, Neither what, is what, daddy. What's, <laughs> what's, 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 he's fighting so that when you guys grow up, that this country can be the same and you can have all the same liberties that same mommy like and daddy today. had when we were growing up. Same like today? Yeah, same like today. So that um, things don't get drastically changed, um, so that we don't get hugely taxed and the government doesn't take all of our money. Mm. And run everything. Do you remember? Go ahead. Go ahead, Peyton. And the Boston Tea Party, just like Paul Revere and the Boston Tea Party and all that stuff that you guys learned in school about why, what did they do? Dump tea in the Boston Harbor. Yeah, why did they dump tea in the Boston Harbor? Because they had too much taxes on tea. That's right. And everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Taxation so, without representation. What? Peyton, do you remember that we talked about all the wonderful things that we have here in this country? The freedoms that we enjoy? That it's not like that everywhere? Do you remember that conversation? Well, I want it to be that way for you guys. Years to come, I don't want it to be. I want it to be as beautiful and as wonderful today, then, as it is now. So I know you want to go. I know. We will take you to Washington, D.C. someday so that you can see the Capitol and so that you can see the monuments and the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> Jack has a drive. He has a drive. He has sat back and watched the news, been out online, seen what's going on, and he sat back. And he's gotten angry, and he can't do that anymore. I'm going to try to get over the Vietnam Memorial. My brother served in 68, 69, and he lost a close friend of his, somebody that I had met um, over there, and I want to go over there and uh, etch his name on paper. But um, I just... Uh, just a special place in my heart for veterans, particularly, <clears throat> particularly Vietnam vets, because they uh, they never got the respect that they deserved and wanted and needed. They never got it. I think people are coming out of their homes. I hear again and again from people.
people coming on September 12th, the story that I've never shown up at a town hall meeting, I've never shown up at a protest, I've never even talked to my congressman, but I have to show up now because things are out of control. This is Jenny Beth Martin with Tea Party Patriots. And one thing that I can say in response to that, that I'm hearing from a lot of our people around the country is they want their congressmen and senators to listen to them rather than to be lectured to by the congressmen and senators and the president. They think it's time for their elected officials to pay attention to what they have to say. Everybody that I talk to are excited. I think this is going to be a huge event. There's no way to know for sure, but I think it's going to be an absolutely big event. Hi. Hey, Joy, it's Jack. We spoke yesterday. Hey. How are you? I'm just ducky. Hey, look, I've got a friend of mine who wants to get uh, get on the bus. If you could uh, book him a place, I'd appreciate that. They're expected between a quarter million and a million people. Oh, that's great. And, um, you know, there's also, as of today, the Tea Party Express started in Sacramento. So that's going to take them two weeks to get to D.C. They're going to end up on 912, that whole bus caravan that started in California. <laughs> That's so, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a memorable day. <laughs> Sign making stuff. Right. I got an email today with all the list of all the buses that are coming in from around the country. Um, so I can find out when they're arriving. We have an army of volunteers. It's just that we're located all over the country. And they'll be doing a lot of this work. It's, it's here and it seems small because we, we're volunteers or most of us are volunteers, and we're from all around the country, and we do this using free utilities on our computers. For instance, this right here is a Google document. I use Gmail, we can chat using Gchat, and this is the way that we communicate. That's Put good. in our packets mm -hmm. to the people, and then highlight the routes, maybe right. where we're gonna be. Right, Just well, Linda is one of my very good friends who I've known for years, and she's, she's helping me out. Why am I involved? Because I'm a wife, a mother, a teacher, a grandmother who really cares about our country. Just, just grassroots people. That's all we are, our grassroots people. I think the silent majority is going to be heard loud and clearly. Three hours sleep. No big deal. We're ready to welcome you. Come on, guys. We're ready for you to be in DC. We're going to stand there when Obama goes by, and we're going to have our protest signs up. here on this panel is how to have an effective lobbying meeting with your member of Congress and hopefully that's something that a lot of you are going to leave here and go do today. One of the most important things you have to do is have a message and most of you know what the, the Tea Party movement message is. It's about fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. This is a republic. It's a representative republic where the voice of the people is are, uh, is important to the process. That's what's destroying America. And the, the, that vote and the students are the two things. I've never seen this before. They're incredibly effective. Why? That, what do you think happened over the, the August recess? <laughs> That's, that was the wake up call for America. And you asked the Democrats who had these meetings and are coming back now when they were committed to vote for cap and trade when they. Yeah, uh, only uh, five weeks ago, and now they're on the other side of the issue. 
We've seen and talked to a lot of different people about this, and what is amazing about it is, is how afraid people truly are. Enough so that people would donate five hundred dollars so that other people could go to Washington D.C. for them. Is that right? That we have a charter bus coming in on Saturday. Some of the seats are paid for by donors. Other people are unemployed, and it's the last dollars they got in the checking account. So we help them out. That is powerful. It is powerful. That is. They are scared. As doctors, you know, we we took an oath. We took an oath, and that oath said, "I'm going to." take care of you to the best of my ability. I'm going to do you no harm. I'm going to protect you. I think this is an extension of our oath. Our Georgia insurance companies would start to offer those plans because they want No, I'm impressed. The architecture is great. Uh, all the congressmen look spiffy in their suits. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. People say to me, this is all about money, isn't it? And I say, no, it's not about money. It's about the ability to take care of my patients in the way that it needs to be without bureaucrats interfering in it. We have meetings with individual congressmen and senators. We're actually breaking up in teams to go do that and to take our point of view to them individually. Senator Judson Mills. Hi. Can you step in? And I'm a property owner of Maine. Okay. Um, I mean, I can room. check with the scheduler, but honestly, chances are probably not. Good. Oh my gosh! So now you all are part of what organization? Let me see what I can do here. Um, and they can say, you know what? If that's it, that's a ban option. I want to take them off that table and let the states then start figuring out at a more local level actually what is appropriate on it. Why is the government going to do? Because you send it up to the government, you send it up here, and you've got all these special interest groups that are going to have well, that plan. What's driving this discussion beyond politics and ideology? We have, we're in the clinic every day, and our patients don't want this. Nobody. They don't want this. So when you say there's 80% agreement among who? I mean, there's 100% disagreement when you walk outside this building. And we know that this is the greatest healthcare system in the world. We know that people come from all over the world to get their training here. We know that we give the best possible care to all our patients, and I don't even know what I get paid for any particular procedure. We would like to convey to her that we think that a trigger is a bad idea, because it's, it's an inevitable idea the way they set up the system. We're asking the Senator to, to not vote in favor of anything that includes a mandate that forces a one-size-fits-all uh, health plan. Oh boy, look at the doctors coming in. I'm feeling better already. And we stumbled into this uh, hearing, is really what it was, uh, from uh, Congressman Conyers, and it was a health uh, and information uh, hearing, and it was all about single payer. And he had lined up a number of speakers to talk about single payer. Single payer systems have an enormous capacity to create what I believe to be the magic solution to everybody's dream of providing better health quality and better health care uh, to the, to, at the level of the population. <coughs> If you have something you want to lay on a Congress person, don't hesitate. <laughs> we don't feel like we've been involved in the process at all. The people who've been involved in the process supposedly re representing us are not people taking care of patients every day, are not seeing what happens on a daily basis, both on the uninsured and the insured. We all take care of uninsured every day. And that's why we went into medicine to take care of patients. We want to still do that. We want to be able to provide the best health care. And here is an example of how we've taken our time out to come to express to you our concern about a particular thing that we believe could be addressed. He actually suspended his entire agenda and made it a conversation between us and him and his experts. Why have allowed us physicians to actually take care of more patients, even those that are uninsured, which is what all of us are talking about here, was not Washington, was not anybody, was actually the private sector. And you know what it was? Walmart $4 prescription plan. After Walmart came with that, it went to Target and everybody else. Our point here is that sometimes when we let the private sector compete, immediately the cost comes down. We have the best cancer survival rates 
in this country than anywhere else. The Canadian system, yes, you have ac access to the system. Every Canadian citizen has access to the system. However, there's a price to pay. The waits are tremendously long to see a physician, to see a specialist, to have surgery. They have to go by government mandated protocols. Can you convincing me that we don't want the Canadian system? The Canadians say they want the system. And I'm telling you that we've got 50 million people that don't have a dime's worth of insurance. They can't get any system. Well, tell me, what is it that the American people want? The American people, like any human being, of course <coughs> wants good health care. High quality, fast access, good treatment at a low cost. <coughs> the number of Americans that are uninsured is debatable. Oh, it is? Yes, it is. Well, and just tell me what you think it is. Well, I think the number is probably closer to 15 million. Because if you if you exclude young people who choose not to have health care, if you exclude illegal, uh, illegal immigrants, who we treat now for free anyway, because when they show up to the emergency room, we as physicians are obliged to treat them. The insurance companies don't pay a dime <coughs> because they're uninsured, yet the hospitals eat up the cost. So, Yes, there is, there is a problem. The system needs fixing. But I don't think the system needs a complete overhaul as some of the members of Congress have suggested. In the end, we've got to come up with something. You say we do need reform, yes. but nothing as drastic as a single thing. Correct. OK, well, what do we need? Well, come on up. So you know me, but my name is Van Kasabian. I'm originally from uh, Montreal, Canada, where I trained, and then I went to do my fellowship in Houston and was attracted by the American healthcare system. Um, there are good things and bad things on both sides, and that's as honest as I'm going to be. But to, to drastically overhaul the system is the wrong way. Yes, we do have problems. One of the major problems is the insurance company. How is it that an insurance company, insurance companies can get together and, and price fix and we can't negotiate in the same way? That's not fair. That's not level, leveling the, the playing field. If you open up the state borders and let insurance companies accept patients from other states, increase competition, you're going to see uh, a cost go down. There is nothing or very little on court reform. How is that? Well, I don't know. That's why he said he was going to investigate it you can, and have hearings. You cannot have meaningful health care reform without court reform. You can't. We need courts and judges that understand the nuances of medicine, that can evaluate these uh, cases appropriately, throw out the ones that are frivolous, consider the ones that have merit, and not put these in front of um, laymen that really don't understand what's going on. But we don't need anyone to legislate that. We want, we are already, we have that relationship with our patients, number one. He actually suspended the agenda, and we had a debate back and forth, a very respectful, quiet, uh, intellectual, thoughtful conversation back and forth until it got to the part where he pulled the race card. That's what they said. Basically what he said was, uh, let me just tell you that the only reason Republicans won't vote for my bill is because they want to embarrass the first African American president. I don't care if the if the president were white, black, green, yellow, purple. It's a bad bill. A number of people have been out there trying to make it a, a racial issue, which it's not. It has nothing to do with it whatsoever. Being a, a physician is much more than understanding physiology. It requires an understanding of the human condition. Some believe that we are driven by financial considerations. The reality is that these views demonstrate a tremendous lack of understanding of the practice of medicine, and more importantly, a lack of understanding of what it means to be a physician, That's right. to be a healer. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I've spent my whole adult life trying to become this. I love what I do, and I just want to protect it. Um, and I want to protect my patients. And what really scares me the most is the idea of having to take my daughters to the doctor in a government-run system. That is not something that appeals to me, and I'm going to do everything in my power to protect them.
We will not rest until we make certain the government-run health care is ended. It's phenomenal, isn't it? Have you seen how many people are here? I I'm just astounded. We probably have several thousand people here. Doctors, they said, from every state in the uh, Union, all 50. I think that's marvelous. The decisions are made here. If you don't get involved in the process, your voice is never heard. Here we are at Freedom Works. At Freedom There's Works. Brendan. Brendan's I'm, I'm alive. Hi, Brendan. Well. And we're just chatting about some yes. of the, the issues that we still have <laughs> open for the march on Saturday. Now we're happy. We're, we've got, everything's coming together. We're excited. We're expecting a huge crowd. People are already coming into town, filling up the hotels. We're getting a ton of media, so we can't go wrong. And so there's an example where everything overlays perfectly. There was the afternoon, and we were preparing the, you know, the final details for the March on Washington. We had about 30 volunteers in the office, and they were doing everything from preparing signs and, and rolling T-shirts to be handed out to getting um, the final logistics okay. Okay. for managing what we knew was going to be a big crowd. In Texas or here? It's in Dallas. We have an impact on the size of government. We use um, low-cost, high-impact techniques. We don't waste it on... Not the door. We got a nasty call from some anonymous source saying that he had put a bomb in the building and we're evacuating right now. These guys will go to no end. So let's move that way. Whoever would do this on the eighth anniversary of September 11th is a really sick individual. Healthcare alone, we're talking about 17% of the economy, and the government wants to control it. And there's a lot of interest here in town that want to control it. We think we're gonna stop them, and so they're, they're doing this. To be honest with you, we're more annoyed than scared. What can they do, kill me, I guess? I mean, it, what can they do to us? All of us could just not show up tomorrow and this thing is still going on. Nothing is stopping this from happening at this point. And you know what? We're going to show up twice as strong. That's right. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. It's extremely important that each one of you are here tonight. We're at a crossroad in this country. Is government the solution or is government not the solution? I'm here to tell you, I believe government is not the solution, never has been, or never will be. It didn't hit me until two days ago that I'm going today. Wow, we're going up to D.C. and let the government know what's on my mind. How's it going? I'm so excited. We're about to pull off now. The energy's starting to build, and the lion is roared. There's no more sleeping. Here's hungry travelers. I need to feed the biceps. <laughs> Hey, I'm not. I'm not under the influence of caffeine. I'm under the influence of reality, and it's got me in its. Uh, it's got me in its grips. Come on, get some energy. Yeah. yeah. I'm angry. I'm angry at myself for sitting on the couch and complaining all these years, not taking action. We should be proud of what we're doing. All right, we're not heroes. We're doing the right thing. Today, I'm a patriot. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't need an award for that. Giving me an award for doing what I'm doing. It's like giving a cowboy with hemorrhoids a medal for not riding his horse. <laughs> this is what I'm supposed to be doing. It's my responsibility. And I'm hoping that what we're doing here might ignite a little passion in other people and do something. The people that are not voting. Thank you, Jack.
Get up here, man. Come on. Here's a man who's got some passion. Uh, this is the first time I actually got to, to speak in front of some, you know, uh, in front of people. Uh, yeah, it is a much bigger, bigger crowd, more ears. Uh, and, and you're looking at me. I'm really happy that Americans are really standing up and, and starting to voice uh, to show that they have a voice and let the uh, government know that we want you out of our lives. Our voices are going to be heard. We are not going to be ignored. We're going to make Barack Obama's ears ring. March on Washington! Nice weather for uh, reenacting on it. Come on, let's Down with all kings! Down with all potentates! Down with all souls! Up the revolution! Up the revolution! Down with all kings! Down with the House of Lords in Congress! Bring your brooms. You know, hay on a stick thing. And then we're going to let you sweep the street ahead of everyone. Saying, clean up Washington. Oh, my. I love this place. USA! 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 Well, what did you expect in Washington? <laughs> sweep the Congress clean. One more time. Go, go, go. There we are. They're all shooting at me. Hadn't hit me one time. We march down Pennsylvania Avenue to remind them that we are a free people. Give us liberty or give us death. Of the revolution. Now with all potentates and tyrants. Now the best part of the revolution. A warm bed. By pass the secret knock. Hello. Everyone who's physically able to march a mile is going to meet at Freedom Plaza. Okay. And they're going to march down Pennsylvania to the west lawn of the Capitol. And we don't really know how many people to expect. We know there'll be about, well, we know there's over 400 buses that are registered. Um, as of this morning, there were 196 other events around the country in addition to this one here in D.C. Man on the Street, Washington, D.C., September 12, 2009, the Tea Party, here on the street. Tell me a little bit about what we're doing. We're going to march on Capitol Hill. Did you hear that? He's going to march. He's going to march. We're going to march hard. He's going to march hard march with vigor. I don't hear voices. Yeah! Yeah! I would like to give him a couple of real words and have a real debate about things. Causing more taxation, more inflation, or trying to get the government involved in health care. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. Obama, he's going to feel it today, especially if you stick around for a little while, because the people are coming. They're marching and they're angry. I think he's really afraid to face the people. I mean, I'm quite sure that uh, he knows about the march. I and mean, he doesn't really want to, he doesn't have any, any type of concern for that whatsoever. He's got his own agenda that he wants to fulfill, so he's just going to let the 
people march and march and march <laughs> and march to their heart's content. But time and time again, history has shown us that liberty and freedom always prevail over tyranny and over big government. And this is just the beginning of a huge revolution that's about to happen in this country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. From you. So I'm ready to rock. You are sick. You are sick. There's a million people, a million people down there. First ones in line, they form up behind this line then. Sure. Sounds like a plan. Well, I tell you what, they stand right to the right and tell those people to move back. No, I want you to be in front of the line of militia. Let's go Sleeping giant has truly awoken. I almost feel to the point like a soldier going to battle. Say I was there fighting all the way, every way I knew how. It's not too late. Grab your tea and follow me. Rise up.
to DC. <laughs> Apparently, we were not loud enough in February. We were not loud enough in April. We were not loud enough in July. We were not loud enough in August. So we're turning up the volume. <laughs> Congress, Speaker Pelosi, President Obama, can you hear us now? We riot. We riot with peace. We riot with ideas. We riot with faith. We riot with humility. And we will not stop rioting. We are gathered together because our nation is being tested. Our legislators have failed us. Yes. But we all know that the ultimate responsibility rests with us, the people. We're not black America, we're not white America, we're not Hispanic America, we're not Asian America, we're not Native America, we're the United States of America, and united we stand! The media really, the mainstream media at least, wants to ignore us. With numbers like this, they can only ignore us for so long. Speaker Pelosi, if you noticed, we replaced the grass on the West Lawn with AstroTurf. This whole movement started with a handful of people who decided to take to the streets. And they said that, well, conservatives don't really protest. That's not really what they do. But something changed. And it began last year when the Republicans were bailing out Wall Street and it continued when the Democrats were ramming the stimulus down our throats. You push people far enough, you keep pushing, and they're gonna push back. And that's what we've done. This is a day that I've dreamed of for a long time. We stand together today in a critical battle for the heart and soul of America. My friends, I join you today as a fellow freedom-loving American. I'm not here to speak to you, but to stand with you and to join my voice with yours. Too many Americans have fought and died for our freedom, for us to give it away with apathy and silence. The majority of the politicians here in Washington seem to think that Americans are either asleep or stupid. But you prove today that Americans are awake, they're informed, and they're outraged. Now, if you are excited to be here today and help turn our government around, let me hear an amen. amen. Come on, President Obama's in Minnesota today. Let me hear an amen. amen. Now that sound is proof that hell hath no fury like a taxpayer ignored. I hope this is a message to the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party. Neither one is innocent of the problems that brought you here. For us, 9-12, when we worked in the ground pit of 9-11 at Ground Zero, we didn't know it was even going to happen tomorrow. After the sun came up on the morning of September 12th, we had hope that America had survived this incredible attack and that we stand together as a nation, as a people and as Americans, and no one is gonna mess with us. Now we're here today to fulfill a commitment. When Benjamin Franklin walked out of that constitutional convention, he was asked by a lady on the street, she said, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government did you give us? And he said, I gave you 
a republic if you can hold it. And we're here today to hold it. We've started at 10.30 this morning. People were lining up here at 8 a.m. It's 10 till 2 o'clock and people are still coming in. Now if you turn around, you take a picture of Pennsylvania Avenue, there's no slowing down, it's still coming in. I wanna know what the largest gathering for any event here is compared to today. I wanna see what the final numbers are. We're, this is history, we're in the middle of history right now. We're making freaking history, beef. Hey, hello, hey, Patriots here. Oh, I don't think the man at 1600 can hear us. Are there any American Patriots here? Freedom is a very fragile thing, and it is never more than one generation away from extinction. Anyone who has a heart for America can do this because when you look out and you see this crowd, any nervous jitter drains because you know that you know you're fighting for your country and they are too. This is the American moment. We are a free republic and we are going to remain that way forever. We're not here because we're Republicans or Democrats. It's because we're here for patriotism. We need to send a message to the media, to the professors, to all the people who are trying to indoctrinate us with lies that Woodstock is over. Reports are coming in that the highways are closed down and our folks are streaming all the way back to the Washington Monument. Let everybody know that fiscal conservatives are the new center of American politics. I see this as just the, the cusp of what's to come. I mean, this, this is just a glimpse of what people are going to see. Today, a new generation of patriots has emerged to carry that torch of liberty not out of hate, as the media would suggest, but out of love, a love for this country, a love for its principles and its history. You are those patriots. Guess what? The opposition doesn't know what to do about us. If silence is consent, it is now revoked. We the people do not consent to runaway federal spending. We the people do not consent to the notion that we can borrow and spend and bail our way back to a growing America. Let us do as those great Americans we remember in this city have done before. Let us stand and fight for freedom. It is the moral obligation to keep taxes low. We believe it is a moral obligation to be responsible for our families. We believe it is the moral obligation of this government to get out of the way so that that can happen. Now is the time for all Americans to get your chin out of your chest, square your shoulders, pull your pants up, turn your cap around, and be a man. Let's take this country back.
For me, it was something I've been waiting uh, 59 years to see, to see that many people from every state in the union. The Park Service said this is the biggest event that DC ever had. This was the nicest bunch of people. Their, their humor was in their signs. The signs were so creative, and it just said so much about the American people, that, the way they think. And to be a part of that, and then to be the very first person to get to march down the street, I can't imagine anything I could ever do that would that have, uh, have um, such a, an honor attached to it. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine in December that on September 12th, just nine months later, I would be standing in a crowd that large doing something that had makes such a difference in America. And it's just, it's humbling for me. I know it may sound kind of bizarre, but I've been deceived all my life into thinking that I wasn't proud of being American. And uh, I've learned that this country is, the, is and always has been the greatest country that's ever been, gives the most freedom, and everyone should be proud. If you're an American citizen, you should be proud to live in this country and to be an American citizen. I'm not in the military, so I can't give myself completely to my country, but I feel like I did today. By voicing my opinion, by uh, doing what I can to protect the Constitution, uh, I, I did my part for my country today. They gave us this freedom and this liberty so that we could express our opinions, and I think they would be proud today. Today, we had a point of reckoning People will know now where we stand, uh, and we are no longer the silent majority. put it into words. My fellow citizens of the greatest nation in the world stood up after sleeping for a long time and exercised their rights that were protected and treasured and paid for in blood by many people before them to ensure that they have the same rights that our great, great grandfathers had, and that I had. It's not just about me and my own little world. the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely for the purpose of evasion or mental reservation, pledging my life my fortune, 
and my sacred, sacred honor. honor. So, so help, help me God. God. on your teeth. Yeah, but the people didn't buy it. They decided they would fight it and be free. They said this one here's for old King George. As the tea was going
documentary. I loved watching that again and remembering what happened 10 years ago and thinking about the difference that we made in the last decade. And tonight we are joined by some very special people who were in the documentary and who helped make the 912 event possible, the 912 March on DC possible. And so let me just go ahead and introduce these people to you who we're going to have tonight and let, let me have them tell you a little bit about who they are. We're going to first start with Luke Livingston. Now, while you didn't see him in the documentary, he was behind the scenes the entire time. So Luke, why don't you go ahead and quickly introduce yourself to the audience? Well, well, I'm Luke Livingston. I'm a producer in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was there. I've got my press pass right here. I have a habit of holding on to all these things every time I go to an event. The great thing about the Tea Party movement was, um, you know, it started with the April 15th tax day tea parties. And at the one in Atlanta, people were really fired up. And I thought, wow, if there's a call to the Capitol to a big central event, I bet you that's something that needs to be a story that needs to be told because the media was ignoring our event in Georgia, they were ignoring the Tea Party, they were calling them racists or, you know, nut jobs or whatever. So I felt that this is a great human interest story. The story of activists is something I like to tell. Um, we were able to, early on, identify some activists that were moving off the couch like Jack there, that were determined to go to DC. So we thought, we're going to tell the story of five people who are moved from act, moved off the couch into activism locally, and then their journey to the 912 March on Washington, um, and uh, tell their you know follow them along. So we had all these crews going up to this event. We didn't realize what an advantage that would be to have as many as five cameras up there for an event that nobody was really covering. And back then, not everybody had an iPhone. I mean, it was like you had flip phones and stuff. It, I, the HD video wasn't something everybody had in their hand. It was uh, pretty rare to have that. So it was an exciting time. And our crew loved it and we worked very hard and we came up with this video and the video tells the story of these people. And we just wanted to find out, go beyond the signs, go beyond the sound bites, go past all that and tell the story, the true story, what really brings people to passionate belief in something and a, a movement into action. And your story, Jenny Beth, is compelling. I mean, everybody was really interesting in that film. I think the film catches better than anything what happened and that's why it was chosen for the Library of Congress. When we submitted it for a copyright, the National Archives wrote and said, we'd like to secure this for the Library of Congress. Send us a copy. So there's a copy in the Library of Congress right now. You gotta go, they'll pull it out of the, dust it off, take it off the shelf and bring it up to, uh, uh, for viewing. And um, I think I'm pretty proud of that, mainly that it's uh, selected by the US government to represent something that happened. <clears throat> It is um, pretty significant that that happened, and I'm so glad you were there to document it. And we're going to go to to Jack and CL in just a minute. But before we get to them, I want to introduce Brendan Steinhauser, who was in the film. He wasn't one of the people who were was featured, but we wouldn't have even had a 912 march if it hadn't been for Brendan. So, Brendan, tell a little bit about what you did then and and how you were involved in making the 912 march happen. Well, thank you, Jenny Beth, and thank you, Luke, for your uh, reminiscing. You brought back some fun memories there. Um, you know, I was working at Freedom Works. Uh, I, I ended up working there about eight years, and I was there in uh, 2008 when we had the Wall Street bailout. And people forget that that happened under a Republican president and uh, a half Republican Congress, let's say. And so there was really bipartisan opposition to that bailout and, and outrage. And I saw this happening. Uh, kind of with phone calls to Capitol Hill, people were calling our office at Freedom Works. Uh, it was really quite something. And so we helped to lead that fight against the bailouts uh, from our offices there. And we really saw thousands of people um, taking action on their own. Fast forward after the election of 2008, and you have the election of Barack Obama. He comes in pushing the stimulus package and a trillion dollars more in spending. And from where I sat, you know, I was following what was going on across the country. There was first a, a small protest in Fort Myers, Florida, led by Mary Rakovich. Then there was a small protest in, uh, outside of Seattle, uh, led by Kelly Carinder. And I was watching some of this happening just kind of in the news. Actually, Michelle Malkin is the one who covered it on her blog. And I just kind of saw this small movement emerging kind of before my eyes, one after the other. And then, of course, Rick Santelli goes on his famous rant February 19th, I think, 2009, and it just lit a fire. And people around the country kind of got together on social media. We sort of had this 
phone call uh, to discuss, well, maybe we should do a tea party. What does that look like? How do we do it? Um, I actually wrote up a little blog post, 10 easy steps on how to throw a tea party in your community, right? Uh, Michelle Malkin linked to it. Um, it was able to provide some advice and some help to people who were uh, interested in doing that. But I saw that momentum through the calls, through watching on social media, uh, the first round of protests, uh, February 27th. And then literally just a couple of weeks after that, I started to see other Tea Party protests being organized in March. Um, big numbers in Cincinnati and Orlando, three and 4,000 people showing up. And believe it or not, in mid-March, I think it was March 13th or 14th, that's when I actually pulled the permit for the September 12th, uh, 2009 taxpayer march on Washington because I saw the momentum even before tax day, right before my eyes. I would sit there and, and Google search Tea Party and see what would come up. And I would see these little events happening in small towns across the country. And you know, I started to kind of talk to my colleagues at FreedomWorks and say, hey, there's a real movement afoot. If we can help it, if we can assist, if we can um, do something to help encourage this organic movement, let's do everything we can. But yeah, we, we pulled the permit in mid-March, started to organize um, plans to march down Pennsylvania Avenue all the way to the West Lawn of the Capitol. Um, you know, I thought at, at one point we might have 200,000 or 250,000 people. That was my goal. Um, but I was blown away by the ultimate number um, that we that we saw come out that day. And, you know, again, I think we saw this organic movement happening around the country. We supported it. We did everything we could to help local organizers. I actually showed up, um, you know, and met with Jenny Beth and Debbie and others in Atlanta prior to that event. And that's where we actually, as Luke mentioned, announced we're going to have a September 12th event at the Capitol. Y'all come and bring your friends and family. And we just saw the momentum, you know, on tax day and after tax day pick up um, beyond that. Talk radio hosts around the country were talking about the rally. Local organizers were getting buses together. Um, you know, we were doing everything we could to prepare the stage and the sound to alert the media. But it really was an organic, beautiful, uh, you know, grassroots led effort. And we were just so tickled that people were coming. Uh, they were the cavalry, right, as Jim DeMint called them. So we did everything we could there in Washington, D.C. to prepare and to um, to welcome people and to make sure that everybody had what they needed to, to get around the Capitol and, and make an impact. Speaker Pelosi, if you noticed, we replaced the grass on the West Lawn with AstroTurf. This whole movement started with a handful of people who decided to take to the streets. And they said that, well, conservatives don't really protest. That's not really what they do. But something changed. And it began last year when the Republicans were bailing out Wall Street. And it continued when the Democrats were ramming the stimulus down our throats. You push people far enough, you keep pushing, and they're going to push back. And that's what we've done. See, I remember being on the, the starting point of the, the march. And I think it was the first one on, you know, there was a guy sleeping in his car with the Don't Tread on Me Gadsden flag. He was literally sleeping in his car. And I knocked on the window and I said, hey, buddy, it's time to go. It was like 5 a.m. And I mean, within hours, there were just thousands and thousands of people coming out of the subways. They were showing up on buses. It was loud. It was chaotic. And it was beautiful. So it's a day I'll never forget. And I think it, the Tea Party movement really came of age that day and it became a political force. And to, to Luke and Jenny Beth's uh, point earlier, you know, they just kept attacking us. And the more they attacked us, the more Americans joined our cause. That's exactly right. And I'm so thankful that you did the, the work that, that you, you did during that time. I was in those first few weeks so busy helping just get the local events going around the country and planning the event in Atlanta. And it was good to have that permit pulled. And I've learned from the work you did, how important it is when you think you need something, go get a permit and be ready to go. And sweating out whether you're gonna have the money to actually pay for something or not. I've learned, really I learned in March and April of 2009, how difficult it is to plan and to scale an event when you don't even know if you're gonna have the funds to be able to accommodate the crowd that you're expecting. It's, it's a, a real balancing act. Um, let's go to Jack Pierce, who's really featured in the film and is one of the average Americans who got involved in the Tea Party movement. Wow. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate being on this panel and I uh, appreciate the work you people did 
Um, I just showed up. <laughs> um, I, I guess you're asking me to uh, to put in a digested version of one of the most uh, important events of my entire life outside of the birth of my children. Uh, I'll try to I'll try to keep it concise. Um, I I had spent a lot of time uh, over the last the previous three years um, being really angry with my government. Um, disgusted is probably a better word. And I, I was mentoring a young man at the time. And he said he was going to some protests, and I said, why not? I'm angry. Let's go. And uh, I ended up going to a Tea Party rally in Canton, Georgia, and uh, got caught up in it. Uh, and uh, there was no turning back after that. Um, I, I think what stands out to me, uh, there's so many things, but, but the first things that come to mind are, are two things. And, and that would be actually the end of the, not the end of the march, but watching toward the tail end of the march. And I think it was 2.30, 3 o'clock, and I was at the end of Pennsylvania Avenue, and the people were still coming in in droves uh, from side to side. The road was still filled, and it still kept coming in and coming in and coming in. Turn around, you take a picture of Pennsylvania Avenue, there's no slowing down. It's still coming in. I want to know what the largest gathering for any event here is compared to today. I want to see what the final numbers are. We're, this is history. We're in the middle of history right now. We're making freaking history, beef. Um, it, it, I was uh, I was brought to tears. Uh, <clears throat> I was very moved at to see all the people in my country that that, that um, cared enough to do what that they had done. Because I don't know about other people, but uh, I sacrificed a lot of time from work, um, and, and, and there's no regrets whatsoever. But I wasn't the only one. There was a lot of people that went to a lot of work and sacrificed a lot to come out there because it was that important to them. Um, and the other thing is, it was because I'd been watching the lamestream media for a while and I, I shop around my, my news agencies and, and being quite disgusted with that also, I wanted to know what the facts were. So I pulled a, a, a DC policeman aside, I don't know, about one o'clock in the afternoon. I said, hey, you know, what do you think about all this? And and, and he, he said, and, uh, you know, of course, I paraphrase, he said he's never seen anything like this in 20 years. He's never seen this kind of crowd. He said, I've never seen so many well-behaved and clean people either. Um, I think that speaks volumes about us as a movement, uh, that we are not only are not, only are we not uh, astroturf, but we're real and we're common citizens that care about our community, about our country, um, and, and we're respectful. Um, I, I, I become quite uh, disturbed to this day when I hear people uh, and when I'm in crowds and I can't speak up and they talk about the Tea Party and they talk about they're all this and they're all that, you know, and it's all contemptuous because they have no hands on experience. I can tell you uh, being in the front of that line and talking to dozens of people that I talked to numerous Democrats and uh, in several independents and there are people from all walks of life and all creeds. Um, and, and that meant a lot to me because uh, since I got started with this, uh, the Tea Party, you know, I had been I've been called a racist. Um, I've been called a, a bigot, um, uh, just a whole bunch of things that were not factual. And um, it's just it's just not true. It's just people that care enough to get off the couch and do something like me. You know, um, as I said in the video, I'm either part of the problem or I'm part of the solution. And for uh, for once in my life, I started taking action. Uh, to be part of the solution, and I wasn't alone. And uh, I spent, the, to be honest with you, I spent most of the afternoon after that in tears of gratitude. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, because I have the the good fortune to live in the most beautiful, wonderful nation in the world um, that that affords me the liberty. To, I'm sorry, uh, that, that that allows me the privilege to do what we did on that day and. And, and actually to make a difference. Thank you very much for that, Jack. And we'll come back to you in a minute about more of it, but the emotions that you have, I understand that completely. And as I was watching the documentary um, again, I've seen it so many times, but as I was watching it again, I also was moved to tears. You just, we remember so much about that day. And as you and Brendan both have said, these are things that we're gonna remember the rest of our lives. It was an event in a moment in time that it, is unlike anything else that we ever have experienced and likely ever will experience. 
Um, let's go now to C.L. Bryant, who was there. I met C.L. Bryant through Rob Godet, who was one of the co-founders of Tea Party Patriots, and he's involved now with the Cajun Navy in Louisiana. He told me that we had to have C.L. Bryant speak at this, at this rally. And I trusted Rob and we did. And it was one of the best decisions that I think we made about the speaker lineup for the rally. So CL, introduce yourself. Tell people a little bit about you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Jenny Beth. Uh, yes, it was Rob Gooday who captured a speech that I made on April the 15th in 2009, tax day. Jane and I, my wife, had gone to pay our taxes. And we thought we'd check out this Tea Party rally that was going on uh, there in Bossier City, Louisiana, the sister city of my hometown, Shreveport, Louisiana. And when we got there, um, I didn't see any black faces there whatsoever. So I thought that this was just something that you white folks were putting on. And uh, I thought I'd uh, just hang around and see what happened. Lo and behold, uh, nobody knew who I was. I was a preacher down in another parish here in Louisiana and was just up paying my taxes. That's all I was doing, was paying my taxes. And I was asked to speak, and uh, I spoke. Rob Gooday captured that speech, put it on the web, and it wasn't long before I got uh, a notice that it had gone viral. And then I got a call from a fellow by the name I had never met, Jenny Beth, I had never met you either. His name was uh, Brendan Steinhauser from an organization that I had never heard of, and it was Freedom Works. And they were inviting me, along with you, uh, inviting me to come to Washington, D.C. for this rally. Now, I'm a preacher. I'm a country preacher, I was, you know, and uh, this was going to be out of my pocket that I went to Washington, D.C. And I want everyone to know this, that 1.8 million folks that came there we as Americans came there on our own dime, and we came to deliver a message to those people who we had put in office. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is one of those events as a black man in America. And I can say this for, for the first time, when I joined with those people marching in the streets of Washington, D.C., and Brendan, you are absolutely right. They just kept coming. They just kept coming. I remember meeting you and Jenny Beth on the top of the Freedom Works building at that time. We had a, a reception for the speakers on the top of the building, and I had never met any of you. And I asked Brendan, I said, well, how many people do you think uh, are going to be here? And he said, maybe 50,000, maybe 100,000 people will show up. And to me, that was, in, that was an incredible amount. But before that day really got started, it was like an army of human ants coming from every direction that you can possibly imagine. Matt Kibbia finally uh, notified us all that uh, the, the freeway system had actually shut down there in Washington, D.C. That's how many people had come. But as for me, a black man in this country, for the first time, I really knew what it was to have an American birthright with every other citizen in this country. And it wasn't so much about a party, it was about being taxed enough already. A lot of times when I had to explain why I was a part of this, as a black American, they saw this thing that had been vilified by the progressive liberal media called Tea Party, but they didn't understand why we were there. And the reason I was there, as I told you from the very beginning, I was paying my taxes. I had written a check on that day to mail to the government. And when I understood what that acronym was all about, taxed enough already, well, I got fired up enough to speak about that at any venue you can possibly name. Later, of course, I 
uh, lost my church. Uh, Brendan, you and Freedom Works uh, were the cause of me <laughs> losing that church, but uh, I was a much bigger cause. Jenny Beth, uh, we did a little radio together early on. Uh, Hot Tea Radio is what we did with Rob Godet. And, uh, you know, it was a great experience. And later I met this fellow by the name of Luke Livingston, and we went on to do our thing as far as that's concerned. And uh, to all of you, all of the Americans who will hear this tonight, I want you to know that on that day, 10 years ago, on that day, we all were Americans and we were in the spirit of those founders who, in fact, uh, gave us the platform and the foundation for this nation. And I trust that we all will continue to stand up and be counted as Americans and let us together overcome the pain of the past and let that pain be a bridge to our American future. And thank you all uh, for being a part of my life. Uh, Jenny, Beth, uh, Brendan, Luke, I will never forget any of you. Well, thank you so much for that, CL. Um, Debbie Dooley was, I met Debbie Dooley on that first conference call that organized the Tea Party movement. And I found out that she was in Atlanta with me and that we shared uh, some common, some common friends and acquaintances, but we'd never actually met until February 27th, 2000. In nine, that was the first time we met face to face, and we met on a conference call on February 20th, 2009, for the first time. You were there, you were dancing on the stage in the video, in the documentary, and I just would like you to talk a little bit about um, what you saw happen on 912 and how you came to be involved in the Tea Party movement. Okay, um, lifelong Republican, I began to get very disgusted with the direction of the Republican Party, especially after the Wall Street bailout. So I began to get active with Freedom Works uh, because they are the only ones of the national groups that really opposed the Wall Street bailout. And after Obama was elected and I heard Rick Santelli's rant on the Chicago, you know, on the trading floor, I called Brandon, who was with Freedom Works in DC, and I said, I want to hold a tea party. And he said, Okay, here's the information. You need to be on the conference call tonight to plan the first round of tea parties. There were twenty-two of us. Jenny Beth and I met on that phone call, were introduced. We did not meet in person until February twenty-seventh. We've been working together ever since. We planned the Atlanta Tea Party, Tax Day Tea Party, which, <clears throat> which was something else to have to go through. And and then the work with Brandon and then, and then we had the 912 March on DC. There are, I am 60 years old. And so I've seen and been involved with a lot of events in my lifetime. The 912 March on DC, was something you will never ever forget besides the birth of your kids and grandkids that that was just an event you will never forget you will always stand out in your mind november 2nd 2010 will be judgment day for socialists in this building they will go home flying in to to the airport i can just see the picture in my mind now getting off the plane, off the gate, seeing streams of people coming by with Tea Party shirts on. I saw one guy come in and he was unfurling his guests in Tea Party flag. And just streams of people that were very clearly going to the protest. Getting to the protest, I said, oh my goodness, this is going to be incredible. Helping, you know, volunteer and doing a lot of the different things leading up to the protest. Brandon had planned an event that was kind of like a pre-rally to get folks, you know, to get folks excited at Freedom Plaza. He said, I'll be there at 830. We'll have a few hundred people. And I, when I literally got to Freedom Plaza, I froze in my tracks. And I said, oh my God, this is going to be bigger than any of us had ever imagined and thought. Because we had thousands of people already at Freedom Plaza at 8.30. 
we got on stage, we had speakers come on stage, and then the Capitol Police, after a few hours, came to Brandon and said, you guys have reached critical mass. There's too many people there at Freedom Plaza. You're going to have to begin the march to the Capitol way early. We're ready for you to step off, sir. I'm ready. All right, sir, we're going. Hey, stand your rights and files. So that's what we had to do. An incredible experience that you will, I will never, ever forget. And it's all these activists coming together saying enough is enough. We want our government back. We're tired of the out of control spending. We're tired of our politicians not listening to us. And, and it was an experience being backstage, Dick Army and Brandon and I, and uh, I think Boyd and Gracie, Boyd and Gray, all looking from the backstage, looking at the crowd, and we were just speechless. There's not many times I'm speechless, but <laughs> just surveying the crowd, I was like, oh my God, this is an event of a lifetime. And when we left the event, we didn't leave garbage. We were polite. We obeyed law enforcement. And uh, we left everything clean. Everybody took their garbage, put it up. We left it in the same condition as when we got there. It, it was just incredible. I will never, ever forget that. Thank you for that, Debbie. Um, I remember we've, we talked a little bit, each of us is kind of mentioned something about the crowd size, is Brendan and I were planning the, the couple of days before him we're meeting every single day and going through the details and making sure we knew exactly what, what was going to happen. Um, we were, it was almost like we, neither one of us actually wanted to say aloud the size crowd we thought we would get for fear of jinxing the crowd size. And I, I, CL mentioned how we said on that rooftop that Brendan said on that rooftop that we thought there'd be 50,000 people. And what Brendan and I had said is, okay, we know that the Capitol, the West Lawn will hold 50,000 people. Let's just say that's what we're hoping to fill up and leave it at that. And we'll just see what happens because we didn't want to have too much of um, its expectations from the media and we had no idea, we just really didn't know the full size and what to expect. But um, it was, the crowd was the most amazing, it really was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. I was, I didn't go to Freedom Plaza, I was at, on the West Lawn the whole day, organizing and, and doing everything that had to be done for that and emceeing the event. And you might have just watched the documentary and see I look a little bit different now than I did I did then. Um, my children are older and I'm through with mommy weight. But um, I, that crowd, I watched as they were coming down Pennsylvania Avenue and they were coming down and they were coming down and it just kept going for hours and hours and hours. It just, it didn't stop. And I think that as I think of the day, that's the thing I won't ever forget because I knew how far it was from the Capitol to the bell tower, the bell tower um, in the old post office, which is now the Trump Hotel. I knew how many blocks away that was. And it was, the street was completely full and it just kept going and it was completely full for hours. So I knew I had some sense of the crowd size just from watching that. And it, that's the thing that I, I take away from that day is looking out and just seeing all the people and the fact that they just kept coming all day long. And Brendan talked about not having um, a, lot of, a lot of funding for this. We didn't have the funding to have audio visual set up throughout the mall so that we could have big big jumbotrons and other types of televisions throughout the, the lawn and further down for people who maybe weren't close to the stage. And we also did not have the um, speakers. We had microphones and speakers for right near the stage, but we didn't have enough to have that all over, all the way down to cover the whole crowd. So there were people who were standing there watching and were there the whole entire day, but they really couldn't even hear a lot of what was going on on the stage. They just were there because they understood that being there together was so important to do. And, and that's, 
that's exactly what it was. And I'm, it just was quite an amazing day. Well, hey, Jenny Bath. Yeah, Jenny. Go I, ahead. Luke yeah, and Brenda. I, the, uh, the crowd size really presented some problems to us as filmmakers because we came up in a minivan with, with two crews and then we had a crew on buses coming up and we had another crew shooting footage. Uh, there was a local guy. So we, when we got there, all of a sudden the crowd just swallowed up all our logistics. We weren't really that well organized anyway, but suddenly you couldn't communicate because the phone system back then was over overtaxed and nobody could, the phone systems went down. You couldn't communicate with people. And once you got locked into an area, either backstage or out at the reflecting pool or wherever you were, you couldn't move because there were so many people. They were going all the way, they were feeding all the way back halfway down Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, it was a constitution or independence. Um, but um, it was, that was really, really challenging. Um, and I, it's amazing that we were able to come away with some of the footage. We were able to kind of crowdsource some footage from some people that were there that was, that met the standard for the film. But I just want to mention something right here. Okay, so what you got here is a resolution, House Resolution 870 that was presented at the premiere that FreedomWorks sponsored at the Reagan Center. We had AstroTurf carpet, not red carpet, because we wanted to show Nancy Pelosi we were the real deal. And this was presented to me by, I don't know who it was, Brendan, that was there, the Congress people, but there were other, other you probably, there you go, you got the crowd size. But this says 1.7 million people, and it's from Congress. The progressives and socialists would like to think that we had like 50 people there, but we had a lot, and the government verified it. I think it was Congressman Tom Price, who was the chairman of the Republican Study Committee at the time. Um, and Brendan, what were you just showing in, in your screen there? Yeah, I wanted to show, you know, Luke had the resolution. This is a photo, uh, the, the poster that we put out. It's a little hard to see, I know, but I wanted to show that. You know, there were so many people that not only did we fill up the West Lawn, they packed us in like sardines. And then they, you know, the Capitol Police and the National Park Service had different areas that they controlled. So they actually were pushing us only on the areas the National Park Service controlled. Um, you know, so it kind of made the crowd go in different places. It didn't go straight down the mall because they wouldn't let us go all the way straight down the mall. And so actually a lot of the, the folks are not in that photo because they're around the sides. Uh, and Jenny Beth, you were exactly right. You know, we wanted to manage expectations because the media was going to downplay the size of the crowd. So if we told them 50,000 um, and we had, you know, 49,000, they would say, what a disappointing turnout. The night before the rally, I definitely was thinking a quarter of a million was probably what we were going to get. I never said it publicly. You know, I, I just was kind of thinking along the 200, 250,000. But again, if I would have said that, or if you would have said that, and we had whatever number, the media would have said it was disappointing, or they would have said, oh, well, we did a, an estimate, it wasn't what it was up to. So no matter what, it was kind of a lose-lose. Um, but you know, the New York Times, um, I think, did publish this, or they, they linked to it. There was that, that security camera at the top of one of the buildings over Freedom Plaza, and it showed three and a half hours of human beings walking down Pennsylvania Avenue, three and a half hours. There was also, as, as Luke mentioned, some uh, footage that was captured both from the Capitol up at the top and then also from Pennsylvania Avenue as folks walked by. And the Heritage Foundation did some estimating on that uh, as well, and they came up with a number of at least 750,000 conservatively. So... No matter what, the, the numbers are always going to be um, disputed by those on the left and the media. Um, but, you know, the other interesting part of that that I now remember is that when I was talking to the National Park Service, they were saying, well, how many do you expect? Now, if I would have said 200,000, they probably wouldn't have let us be at the West Front anyway. If I would have said anything bigger, they probably wouldn't have believed us anyway. Um, but we gave them the number that was the maximum there on the lawn, as you mentioned, and they kind of, you know, the press kind of ran with it, but nobody really uh, did much work in trying to figure out, at least in the media, how many people were actually there. But, you know, clearly the, the main point of all this is that people came from all over the country, from every state. They had this, we had this fantastic event. They went back home, they got involved or they stayed involved and they made a profound impact um, in our, in our politics and in our culture, a profound impact, winning a historic election in 2010, uh, launching the careers of um, our Vice President Mike Pence in a lot of ways, a national career, helping to elect Senator Ted Cruz, Senator Mike Lee, Marco Rubio from Florida, uh, Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania, countless congressmen, state legislators. I mean, it was an incredible political movement 
Um, and I think we talked about this a little bit offline earlier. You know, I think it's it's fair to say it also laid the groundwork for the current president and, and his election. The idea that we needed somebody who was an outsider. We needed somebody who would shake things up. Uh, we had a number of those to choose from who were either Tea Party candidates or who at least uh, came from so far outside of the traditional politician that it offered people a, a real choice. And so I think that our legacy as a movement uh, is a really strong one. And obviously there's still work to do. We still need to tackle the, the national debt. That's something that's on all of our minds. Um, but we've achieved a lot in the 10 years since this march. That's um, exactly right. Since we're talking about some of the differences that we made in the election even in 2016, Debbie Dooley, what do you think um, about the kind of difference that, that we made? You were a Trump supporter from very early on. I was. I actually endorsed him. I knew in uh, Donald Trump, believe it or not, before he made it official, he was running for president. He was actually, he saw the value of the Tea Party movement because I remember him being on one of our conference calls, Tea Party Patriots conference calls. At some point, he spoke at a Tea Party rally. I met him, I was among a group of about 10 people in, in January 2015 at the South Carolina Tea Party. He met with us and he answered the questions. And then I remember watching him speak with Steve Bannon and we both looked at each other and we said, oh, wow. And I endorsed him early on. I loved Ted Cruz. I just felt like Donald Trump was the man for the job. We wanted somebody that would shake up Washington, D.C. And he has. And I endorsed him. Uh, my endorsement was carried on Breitbart in uh, January 2016. I endorsed him. And I just felt like he was the right person for the job, that we needed a grenade thrower in Washington, D.C., because it was so messed up. And no one, no one, I mean, my friends were saying, what are you endorsing him for? But I had vision to see, you know, what we needed. And no one would have been able to, to withstand the attacks that Donald Trump has. And part of it is because he's a successful millionaire and he has his own money, so he didn't really need money from anybody else. I, I think the Tea Party movement paved the way for Donald Trump. We helped the Republicans take back control of the House. Not only that, the Tea Party movement is very active on the local level. Beginning in 2010, we began to get active on the local level. Level. So you have Tea Party activists. I know in Georgia and I know in other states, they've started to address and change, want to change their local government as well. So the Tea Party has been effective from the bottom up. And I mean, I have people, what, what really amazed me was after Donald Trump was elected president, you know, you have all these astroturf. Uh, movements come up on the left side, and after trashing us thoroughly when when we first started, all of a sudden they were saying, "Oh, this is a, you know." I had media people that I know that that actually reached out to me on the national level, and they said, "Oh, don't you think that this movement that's going on is just like the Tea Party movement?" And I said, "Oh, it absolutely is not." I said, "We weren't astroturf. We weren't funded. We were begging for money." And we were respectful of law enforcement. We obeyed the law and we were very respectful. And, you know, but it's amazing. They're trashing us in 2009, 2010, 2011. All of a sudden, in 2017, they're trying to compare these movements that are violent movements and, and very negative movements with the Tea Party movement. That is um, exactly right. And they even still, they're, they're, they're trying to blame a lot of things that are happening in the country on, on what we did. And it's, it's very frustrating to see that and to see the liberal attacks and the way that they do everything they can to malign us and frankly, just to rewrite history. And if they don't like, the New York Times recently wrote, um, essentially a, a hit piece on the Tea Party movement, and even the hit piece wasn't enough, and people on Twitter were, were upset that they didn't call us um, 
terrible things and say that we were racist or whatever else. And the New York Times went and edited the um, edited their article. And I just, as that happened, I was thinking they actually need to go back and watch the Tea Party documentary because that's this, the documentary explains what was going on as this movement started. And the New York Times, they didn't pay attention to us then. And now they're trying to understand what we were about and, and how we were able to make the difference that we made. And to, to malign us also because they're trying to rewrite history. I want to go to Ben next. We've got Ben Burkwam with us, who is from California. He was in the documentary. He wasn't one of the featured people, but he was in it, and he's moved through this movement, and he's doing a lot of amazing things today. So, Ben, tell us a little bit about um, what you what you're doing. Let's start with what you did leading up to the 912 March, and how you wound up being in the 912 March, and then I want to hear what you're doing to, today as well, please. Yeah, it's interesting. I didn't realize it had been 10 years until Luke sent me the invite to join you guys on this. So thanks for having me. Uh, Jenny Beth, we were back back then. And uh, I, you know, I was in college at the time. I was finishing my undergrad and then going into grad school. And I was just sick of the direction our country was going. I'm a, a child of a pastor father and a nurse mother who were both missionaries in Africa for 10 years. And we've lived all over the world. We, I've seen what uh, desperation is. I've seen what tyranny is, and I've also seen what opportunity is. And there is no question that there's no greater country in the history of the world to provide opportunity to any person, regardless of the color of your skin, than America, and, uh, or, or what's between your legs. You know, the, the attacks we have going on now, and we've been having going on for decades now, to uh, demonize and uh, to undermine America, the foundations of America, these I was young then, and I was actually watching the, the, the video. We're at the beginning of the this new revolution, and I'm uh, honored this and proud to be a part thing. of it. I mean, this is, this is people from across thing. America, an and we're American saying thing. this, we're taking this in a new direction. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so stoked that I just don't know what to say. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see this. I, I just pray that this is that the beginning, and it doesn't now, fizzle. I see this thing as, as, as just the, the cusp of what's to come. I mean, this, this is just a glimpse of what people are going to see. And it's interesting. My, my core values haven't changed. My ability to communicate my ideas uh, have gotten better, I'd say. But the, the core values of faith, family, freedom, our nation founded uh, as God is our foundation, and uh, a limited government. I, obviously, the Tea Party was fiscal responsibility, limited government, and um, what's the last one? Uh, free markets. Free markets, yeah, which I agree with all those, but there was a foundation that was always pivotal to my involvement which, with it, which was God, and you can't, you can't separate those. You look at our founding documents, and so I, there's just this idea of separation of church and state and all this other nonsense that came along with it um, really are the, the core foundations that I was interested in. I live in the Central Valley of California, and I've seen what government overreach has done. I, I was invited to join the 912 event with my involvement with farmers in the Central Valley that have been destroyed, especially on the west side of California, uh, of the Central Valley, by radical environmentalism that chose a uh, two-inch non-native fish species over feeding the world. And we, uh, we so that was really kind of what got me into it. I was, I was communicating on their behalf. And it was just a, a true honor to be there. You know, it, it's not until I look back at it now that I realize just what an honor that was and what a pivotal moment in my life that time was. I was actually the opening, opening, opening speaker before the, the cameras even started rolling. I got the invite the night before to uh, speak on behalf of the Central Valley and the plight of the Central Valley farmer. And I still have never actually seen the video of, of my actual speech, <laughs> which I'd love to see that if uh, somebody there were 200,000 people out there. Plus, uh, I'm sure somebody has a video of it somewhere. So I'd still love to see that. But uh, it was just an honor to be there. And, and then from that, we you know, went back to the Central Valley, helped elect uh, in, in my local area, a city councilman who was a part of our Tea Party, uh, Steve Brandau, and, and uh, several, countless others across the country who, who rose out of this, you know, the, the so-called silent majority. I, I absolutely agree with uh, CL's uh, and some of the others before me that were speaking about the, the impact of the Tea Party. I was, uh, I, I, I came on board, I saw the change that it made. A lot of people, you know, the, the attacks that it got, all the names that we were called back then, uh, teabaggers and all the other, which we ended up taking on as, as, uh, as a, 
kind of like the deplorables, you know, is we, uh, everything that they threw at us, we just took it and said, fine, call us whatever you want to call us. We're going to keep moving forward. But there's no question the Tea Party had a significant, positive, uh, in profound impact on politics in America. And uh, President Trump is a direct result of that. I, I absolutely believe that had it not been for the Tea Party movement or th that kind of movement, a populist movement where the people finally said, this is too much. We've had, we've taken, we've had too much in California in particular. It's, it's even gotten worse since then. So I see a lot of positive changes, but uh, the reason I got back involved was because it's still, we are, we are desperately clo uh, close to losing this nation. We're desperately close to not being a constitutional republic. Uh, we're desperately close to losing the foundations that the, the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, Second Amendment that our founders fought and many of them lost their lives for. But there is, there is a wave of people, there is a remnant of people that is being called to stand for such a time as this. And uh, I believe I'm part of that and I'm, I'm honored to be a part of that. So now we're at a, a, a make or break point. This is uh, in, in our nation's hit. Had Hillary Clinton won, they were, that's why they, they're freaking out so bad right now. They thought they had it. They thought uh, socialism was gonna be the norm. They thought this radical environmental policy and, and climate change and all this nonsense was going to be uh, the direction our country headed, the uh, LGBTQXYZ and transgenderism and the undermining of the family. They thought it was over and they had it won. And to see President Trump come in that wave of populism for America, it was, uh, I, I just, I saw, I, 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 again, I just felt the call to get back into it. And I, so what I, I did, I just started going out with my phone. This was when live streaming just started happening. And so I would go out and take my phone and hold it up in the air and go and try and find common ground with folks and have uh, do little interviews on the streets. And in that process, I was in Berkeley at the uh, second battle of Berkeley. I got attacked and got 13 stitches in my head and my ear for uh, mm. simply having a difference of opinion uh, by the uh, so-called anti-fascists, which are truly just the, the most fascist people in our country right now. Um, and that grew into what I'm doing now, working uh, Frontline America, started that, and then now working for America's Voice to continue to spread the message. And this is the key to me. My calling is shining light in the darkness, raising up the Christian conservative remnant. But the, the key is communicating to this generation and impacting our culture. We are in a culture war. We are the, the counterculture of today. And uh, but if we don't stand, if we don't communicate, if we don't challenge and, and uh, reject the premise of the enemy, we're going to lose this nation. We are so close to losing this nation. So that's my core focus right now is communicating in the arena of ideas to win back our culture, to, which will ultimately then impact the votes of the people. And that's what I'm doing. That's great. Thank you for that update. And I'm sorry you had the stitches. And you mentioned something about how you were invited right at the night before. We were just scrambling to get as many of the grassroots activists who were in, in Washington, D.C. to make sure that you were able to speak. And we wound up starting the rally, the way you were describing it, it was a pre, pre, pre rally. We right. started hours before the official start time. So in the documentary, you hear me say, welcome to the official start time of the this 9-12 March on DC. But the fact was we'd already been going for two and a half or three hours before the official start time. The official start time was for C-SPAN and for all of the media. But but we wanted to make sure that the people who organized, who paid out of their own pocket, who helped get to DC and to bring other people with them, that they, they it, it was about every one of you. It was about the normal people, much less than about the politicians. Um, Jack, we, and we've been going almost an hour now, so we're, I know we're going to have to, to wrap up, but I want to know, Jack, a little bit more about just where you are today and what you're doing, and also how old are your, your kids? Because they were in probably elementary school back then. Yeah, my kids were uh, seven and eight at the time. Um, and it, I actually, I, it, I think it's worthy to note, I was a, a licensed health insurance broker at the time that this came around and I was a threat to my, what I perceived to be a threat to my professional life 
and it turned out it was, I lost my job and did thousands of other um, life insurance, life and health insurance agents. But uh, my kids at the time were seven and eight. Um, they're now, as you said, they're grown up now, they're 17 and 18. I have one in military school. Um, I have one who's going to be going back to school here uh, shortly. Uh, immediately following uh, the release of the movie, or actually even before that, I was um, approached by some people at the local and state level to get involved uh, and run for some offices, and uh, I was quite flattered. I, you know, I, I just was honored by that. It was not the right thing for me to do at the time. Um, and I, I think, oddly enough, one of the reasons was that I was too blunt I was too Trump-like. I don't think that uh, our, our state level was ready for Trump at that time. Um, but uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm very far removed from it, although I'm beginning, beginning to become uh, very stirred up after watching the video again today and then listening to you folks. Um, I don't know what the future holds for me, but I know that I have more hope for my country today than I did um, in November of 2016. Um, uh, I, I actually have hope with Trump in office, and, and I think it's, it's and, and I agree with all of you. I think that, the, you know, we set the groundwork for even the, the remote possibility that somebody that far outside of the, of, of the norm be, could, could become president. Um, I, I, I'm just thrilled with the, the fact that he's, he's filthy rich and that he doesn't need other people's money. I feel much more confident that he's going to vote, and he's going to, excuse me, he's going to act in a way that consistent with his beliefs and not swayed by another human being. Um, but I, in short, I, I don't, um, I'm not involved in the Tea Party at this time. Um, I leave all options open. Um, I love my country uh, as much as life itself. And I still fear, um, as Ben had mentioned, I fear for the future right now. And I, I think unless the more bold steps are taking, uh, taken very soon, that we're going to see the uh, the greatest nation that's ever, ever existed. Uh, uh, go away. Thank you for sharing that update. And I can assure you, we are doing it, everything we can to prevent that from, from happening. In fact, Tea Party Patriots Action is going to be doing a rally next week in, in Washington, D.C. It's going to be on a Thursday, not on a weekend. The theme of it is Stop Socialism, Choose Freedom. We think it's very important that we're just putting a marker in the ground right now and saying we've got two different paths for America's future. One is a, a future with, with freedom and optimism and hope. And the other one is a future with more government control. And uh, it is socialist. And we have people who are, are outright calling for socialism in this country. And I don't even think that some of those people understand what they're calling for when they do it. They may have very good intentions. They may be well-meaning. I don't think they understand the unintended consequences of what they're calling for right now. And it's up to us to make sure that we educate our fellow Americans to explain those differences and why we have to continue on the path of freedom. And Can also I to re remind people that freedom takes eternal vigilance. You, you have to continue to fight to, to, to keep freedom alive. It, it doesn't just happen by accident. It happens deliberately and on purpose. Um, Can I jump in on that? that yes, Jenny please. Uh, this is one of those things that, that uh, gets me. I'm out there all the time confronting these little snowflake lefties that are out uh, screaming and crying and, and hitting people over the head with sticks to stop the, the, you know, the fascists and all this nonsense. But uh, the reality is that, that it's the same uh, it's true today as it was during the Tea Party and before. The reason we're in the situation we're in is not because of the left or because of the enemy. And when, when we're talking about spiritual in spiritual terms, it's because of the lack of, uh, of people standing in the gap, people willing to stand on behalf of righteousness and truth. And the Tea Party started not so much, I would say, against the Democrats. It was against weak Republicans that weren't willing to stand up for decades uh, for the values that cons that we hold uh, as conservatives and uh, primarily fiscally around the Tea Party. But the same is true now. The reason that democratic socialism has taken a foothold is because conservatism, free market capitalism hasn't been communicated effectively. And in a lot of cases, it's been undermined, the crony capitalism and you know the, the big business, the, the chambers of commerce working to undermine the our, our what capitalism really is in a free, in a true free market, and so we're we're not battling necessarily 
socialism, we're, we're, we just haven't communicated capitalism effectively. We don't really have a free market anymore. And so uh, that's, that, that's the big thing. A lot of you, you're right. These people are ignorant. The people that I talk to on the streets that are asking for socialism and communism, they have no clue. They have no clue the millions uh, of deaths that they're asking for it, w with either of those options. But it's because they don't know any better and because of what they see in our current government and in our current economy, which is not free market, is not capitalism. Uh, we have a, a huge way to go to get there. And, but that's, that's why we're here. And that's, I totally agree with you. That, that's my concern is this is, AOC can go around and spout all this nonsense because kids nowadays, this next generation have no clue what the differences are. Uh, they've never seen the difference. They've never experienced it or you know, been educated on it. That's exactly right. And a, a different project that we are just beginning with, um, Luke, is actually we're working on, we're in the very beginning phases of it, a documentary to document people who have come here to America to escape communism or socialism and what they left and why they think it's so important that America continues on a path of freedom. And we've done one mini documentary with a man from Venezuela, and we told about his story, it's about nine minutes long. We, we have, um, as soon as we emailed that to our list, within, within less than 48 hours, we had 12 different people reaching out saying either someone in their group or they personally had left a country that was socialist or communist and they wanted to also tell their story. So we're, we're working to actually make that a reality so that we can, can have these stories out there so that people understand why we're against this and the real world impact of it, not just because I'm saying it's bad, I've lived here in America my whole life, but because the people who have come here from these other countries have escaped One something the terrible and they don't wanna see America go down that same path. Of the power of the um, we need to start to wrap up and what I'd like to do to wrap up is get from everyone just, um, some inspiration for the people who are listening tonight. What would you like people to know either about why what we did was important and it will make a difference in the future or what they need to be doing now as we look to the next 10 years? And Ben, why don't we go first with you and then we'll go to Jack and CL and work our way around backwards. Thank you. And sorry again for jumping on late. Uh, but yeah, the uh, so first my call to everybody is every one of us have a part to play in this, no matter what how if you feel insignificant you're not each one we're different parts of the body some of us are called to speak some of us are called to be more behind the scenes but whatever that is whatever that inspiration is within you and this has been my message for the last 10 years is is do that whatever that thing is that you're called to do don't try to do something that other people are doing just get involved in some way to impact the future and i do see i see what we're doing, I travel the country all the time. I rock the MAGA stuff all the time. And it's not so much even pro-Trump. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's a rejection of the intimidation that the left thinks that they can get away with by trying to silence people that, uh, that, that they, they disagree with. So what I've seen, though, as I continue to travel is when I first started doing this, there was a lot of fear. People would come up and they'd whisper in my ear, hey, I support you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Now it's open. People are running up in the airports. They're high-fiving. They're, they're shouting. I've got uh, flight attendants and, and pilots that go out of their way to say it overtly. And so I think uh, America's waking up. You're not seeing it in mainstream media. You're not seeing it in our education system. You're not seeing it in politics necessarily directly yet, but it's happening. And as that lag, those lagging indicators start to catch up, as media outlets like ours, America's Voice News start to catch up, you're going to start to see huge shifts in our culture if we continue in this direction. So I would just encourage people, keep standing up, keep fighting back, keep rejecting the, the premise of the left and the premise of the enemy, and we're going to win. Thank you for that, Ben. And one last thing, how can people follow you? Because you've got um, some great things that you're doing. So if they want more information, where can they go? Uh, you can Google Frontline America, uh, or you can go to America's Voice News, and we've got a new show coming out. We're just announcing it called Chasing Freedom kind of ties right into all of this. It'll be the, uh, it, it's combining the social media and uh, conservative activist world with network, uh, network news from obviously from an opinion journalist perspective, not straight line journalist. I have, I come from that opinion, but anyways, Frontline America or America's Voice News, you'll find me. 
Great, thank you very much. Okay, Jack, what about you? What would you encourage people to do, especially new people who are getting involved for the first time, either they work the Trump campaign and maybe haven't been activists since then, or, or they're just starting out? <laughs> um, I guess I'll, uh, the, the biggest takeaway or one of the biggest things that, that pro propelled, propelled me to be in, in, involved with the Tea Party is that the first three words, we the people, it's our government, it's our government. And if we don't like what's going on, it's because we're not doing what we need to do on our end. It got out of hand a long time ago, and it's our job to take it back. If I'm not happy with what's going on, I need to take the action. The government is for me, the country is, I, I, I'm supposed to be represented and I haven't been for a long time. So if I'm not happy with what's going on, I need to take an action. And the other thing that, uh, that comes to mind is uh, a wise man once said that a government big enough to give you everything you want is powerful enough to take away everything you have. I think we all need to remember that. Thank you very much for that. One thing that you did in the documentary, you talked about how back then, a decade ago, you recruited three people to, to join the movement. And I think that, that that's really powerful because it has a multiplying effect. And as Ben was saying, it's, it's every single one of us working with the talents and the gifts that we have and doing what we can together, that makes a movement and together it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, I agree. You know, we all have a talent. We all have something to offer. You know, and maybe you don't know what that is. Go to a go to a rally. Get involved and find out the contribution that you can make to help to make a difference. I, I don't want to jump in too much here. I forgot to say one thing, but it ties right into this. It's influence influence the people you have influence over. Each one of us have a sphere of influence, and if we were all to just target those things, I, I talk look at the the black conservative movement, and we talked about. Jexodus and all this other these other areas uh, Latinos for Trump and all this stuff that's going on now There are places that I can go that uh, I have influence in that other people can't go and, and vice versa We each have those places to go go to those places influence those people and convince them to join you to influence others That's how we win that, That's great advice. Okay, CL. What about you? What do you what do you recommend? Well, I recommend this let us never forget that our nation is a land that is blessed by God from sea to shining sea. And we have an endowment that is given to us by our creator, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That is what Tea Party has been all about. That's what Freedom Works is all about, of which I am a senior fellow there in Washington, D.C. I encourage all of you to download free the C.L. Bryan Show app daily. We're on across the nation on Red State Talk Radio. Jenny Beth, I got to get you on the show brendan we must reconnect and of course luke we have to talk and so i certainly do appreciate this this opportunity and thank all of you for uh, helping us reunite and remember this folks um when we think about the american dream it is the only nation that the word dream is associated with there is no russian dream there is no chinese dream there is no english dream or Cuban dream or Nigerian dream. There is the American dream. It doesn't matter who, where you came from or who your father was or your parents were. Whoever comes to America legally can come here and of course pursue their life, liberty, and their happiness. And as I have closed so many speeches since that one that I gave uh, there in Washington, D.C. on 9-12 in 2009, I will forever encourage each and every one of us who have the American DNA to stand up, stand up, stand up. God bless you all, and thank you so much for having me be a part of this today. Thank you very much, Dale. I'm so glad Rob introduced us all those years ago. Okay, Debbie Dooley, what about you? What words of inspiration do you have tonight for everyone? Well, I help organize about four or five CNN fake news protests. <laughs> we showed up. We, we were just attacked by a snowflake one time. He was pretty quickly uh, on the ground in a fetal position because most <laughs> of the people that attend our rallies have concealed carry permits. But one of the things that we found out 
walk around holding signs up, engaging with the people in a peaceful, positive manner. We had people thank us. We would show up on street corners with uh, pro-Trump signs. People would say, thank you for being here. You don't have to have a big crowd. You don't have to have a stage. You can make a difference by holding pro-Trump signs or pro-conservative signs and have a walking rally. Get five or ten people together. Walk around your city block holding the Trump signs and engaging the people. Go to street corners. Hold up pro-Trump signs or pro-Tea Party signs. Just get your friends, three friends. Go to street corners. Hold the signs up, and, and people will honk your horn. People actually thanked us for that. When we were the last time we were in downtown Atlanta at CNN, we had a lot of African Americans coming up to us saying, "We're with you." Uh, they were all together, you know, they were individuals, and, and they said, we like what you're doing, and thank you for being here, because people want to see people that are proud to support the president, that we're out there talking to the people, so you don't have to have a big crowd. Just get a few of your friends together. Start waving signs, going out, going out in the heartland, going to Main Street America, and let people see we're proud that we're Tea Party activists, and we're proud of our president, and we're proud of our conservative values, and we are going to win and kick butt in 2020. Thank you very much for that, Debbie. And uh, let's go to Luke, and then we'll go to Brendan. So, Luke, what well, about you? Well, over the last 10 years, documenting the conservative movement, you know, what really comes to mind is the old couple standing at the rope line in Atlanta. They must have been in their 70s or 80s, and they stood there all day at the, at the railing, of the, you know, watching the speakers. I thought, and I was new to this, is why are they, why are they standing there? You know, what, they're so passionate about this. There's something humbling about that to me. And so I've set out to document people rising from the couch into activism. And I've, someone like Marianne Mendoza, you know her, Jenny Beth, we interviewed her back after her son Brandon was killed by an illegal alien. And she was just a house mom in a townhouse sharing a, a letter of frustration with the newspaper to Obama that was never, he never responded to. And then she takes, it by, she takes the reins and she says, I'm going to move into activism, just like you have, Jenny Beth, and everyone here. And she, next thing I know, she's at this event and that event, and then she's in the Oval Office driving, you know, uh, new legislation and executive orders you know, nationally. So what I do is I encourage anybody here, baby boomers that have been reunited with our founding principles through the last 10 years of Tea Party training and things like that, you know, use all that education. You know, you got, we were all brought back to our founding principles during the Tea Party movement. And we need to take that training and what we learned and, and push it forward. At least the baby boomers do. Don't give up. There's a lot of us out there with time on our hands now, and we can be the, do a lot of heavy lifting for the Tea Party movement. We can show up at the rally um, next week, you know, in Washington, D.C., I think it's uh, Thursday, you know, the Stop Socialism rally. We know a lot more about our founding principles than a lot of kids, and, and they need to be taught. So I would encourage baby boomers to get back involved, all right? Young guys like Ben, you know, Candace, all them, they, they're, they've got new movements, they're sparking, like, like, like CL talked about. But, you know, we were there too, and we can, we can, we can share that information and get people inspired, people like Marianne Mendoza, people like you, Jenny Beth. I think, you know, it's just incumbent on us and Debbie, you too, to take that information we learned the last 10 years and push on. Thank you very much for that, Luke. And now, Brendan, what about you? What words can you give to everyone? Well, I think summing a lot of this up, you know, the Tea Party movement started out as a local organic grassroots movement to fight for conservative values. That's where we began. We became a national movement with, with great leadership at the local level, the state level, the national level. We just worked to what we worked well together to build a national movement. We came to Washington 10 years ago today to say that our voices would be heard. And I remember thinking this then, and I think I even mentioned it to the crowd, you know, now go back home, go back to where you came from and keep the fire of revolution lit. Go and focus on uh, your local community. And I think that's what I would leave with people is there, if you want to have an impact in the national level, at the presidential level, 
the most good you can do is in your community. So go do all the things everybody here is talking about tonight. Um, do it in your city, your town, your county, uh, from there, the state house or state senate level, and then on up. But focus on your neighborhood, your neck of the woods, and if, if you're a leader in that uh, in that neighborhood or in that community, you will have a major impact. And I think that's what we can all do. And if we all kind of hold ourselves and each other accountable to know that we're going to continue that work, then we can rest assured that the Tea Party movement, ten years later, will not only live on, but it'll thrive into the future. That is great. Thank you very much for that, Brendan. Um, as we close out, before I give my words of inspiration, I want to say something to you, Brendan, and something that people may not realize. Um, you, personally, and Freedom Works, um, broadly speaking, were you set an example for me as I work to build Tea Party Patriots for how to be a coalition partner, what to expect from coalition partners, and how to, to share um, in events and not try to hog all of the, the fame to myself, but to make sure that everyone who is making an event possible is able to be there and be part of it and that they also get the credit. You you did that with me and you did that in freedom works did that with tea party patriots i was a, a national co-coordinator for that 9 12 march on dc at the time tea party patriots didn't we weren't even raising money we barely had money to buy t-shirts that we were able to to um have available for donations that that week um but we, we didn't have any money. What we were able to offer was our time and our organizational skills. And you guys took that and said, if you will organize it, you can be a co-coordinator with us and, and you let me emcee it. And it just, it, it set the stage for how we operate at Tea Party Patriots. And I don't know that I've ever thanked you personally for that. And I feel like I should do that right now publicly. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I I want to say thank you, and I believed in you then, and I believe in you now, and uh, I believe in the movement and the cause, and it was always about all of the, the folks who, who did the work at the local community level, and uh, we were just so tickled uh, to play a role in this movement and to work with all of you. Uh, it was important to us that, um, that credit wasn't an issue, that we all shared in that. There was enough to go around, enough work to go around, clearly, and you guys worked and are still working, and so I just want to let you know that I appreciate you and everybody at Tea Party Patriots. Well, thank you very much. Um, and at Tea Party Patriots Action, we have, we have a weekly action item for people to take. This week and next week, it is loaded every single day. It's not normally like that, but with Congress coming back from being on recess or summer vacation for all of August, there's a lot to do right now. But you can go and find that action item every single week by going to teapartypatriots.org forward slash this week, teapartypatriots.org forward slash this week. Sometimes it's, it's big things to do, like planning an event or organizing an event locally. Other times it's picking up the phone and making a phone call or sharing something on social media. We try to make it possible. So if you've got time for five minutes or five hours a week, we've got something for you to do. So be sure to check that out. There are ways to contact us and get involved. Um, and we are here to support you. So if you want to do something locally and you need help, please see what we are offering in terms of weekly calls to action. And then if you need anything from us, you can always reach out to me personally. I give my email address out. It goes to me and a couple other people on the, my team so that we're able to help. So it's jenny.beth, jenny.beth at teapartypatriots.org. And the weekly call to action is teapartypatriots.org forward slash this week. And finally, I hope everyone who's watching can make their way to D.C. next week for the Stop Socialism, Choose Freedom rally. Starting today, we must begin again the work of remaking America. The first thing we're going to do is make sure the tax system makes the wealthy pay their fair share. If the taxes are so high that if you become successful, all your money gets taken away from you, nobody wants to live in that society. If you like your doctor or health care plan, you can keep it. We have to pass the bill so that you can find out what is in it. We need to make public colleges and universities tuition free. The way that socialism is implemented, nothing is free in reality. Climate change, one of the biggest 
existential threats. They're asked how they're going to pay for it and they just can't come up with an answer. Socialism hasn't worked and it's led to the demise of one of the most prosperous in Latin America and Venezuela. Government that's big enough to give you everything you want is a government that's big enough to take away everything you have. America will never be a socialist country. We're thinking of having a Chicago Tea Party in July. All you capitalists that want to show up to Lake Michigan, I'm going to start organizing. You find a socialist, kick him out of office. Get out of our doctor's offices, get out of our businesses. We want smaller government. Let's get for freedom! It's next Thursday, September the 19th. We're beginning at 11 o'clock in the morning. We'll be through around 1 maybe 1.30 in the afternoon. And then we want people to be able to go speak to their congressmen and both of their senators to make sure that, that your, your members of Congress understand that you stand for freedom, you want them to stand for freedom, and you want them to support our efforts for freedom, which includes supporting President Trump and his agenda and supporting the Constitution and not taking actions that will infringe on our constitutional rights. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for being on this panel to all the panelists. Thanks to everyone who watched the Tea Party documentary again tonight on the online premiere. And thank you for everything that you do to make this Tea Party movement possible. We didn't start the Tea Party movement. None of us even here on this panel did. It was started by Sam Adams in Boston. We are just heirs to it. And we're holding the torch of freedom and liberty right now. It's up to us to make sure that we're able to pass that on to our children and our grandchildren so they can pass it on. So join us and do that. And we will continue to make a difference. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you.